And welcome everybody live to the Jim Masters Show, Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. It's so great to have you with us today, and we are celebrating a true American icon. He's touched our lives for so many years through music, through stage performances, movies galore, television performances, and it is extraordinary. We're talking about somebody that, again, as soon as you hear the name, you know who I mean, the incomparable Pat Boone. Yes. And what's really amazing about Pat, he has been doing this for well over 70 years. This is the 70th anniversary in entertainment, music, television, movies extraordinaire. And in June, he's going to be celebrating, get this, hard to believe, life goes by in a New York minute, his 90th birthday with a phenomenal family celebration, private celebration with the dearest ones in his life. And that's going to be an amazing event as he celebrates uh, 90, which is just in a few months. And again, he's truly one of those people that when you hear his name, you just feel good because he's made us feel so good through the years with all of his incredible performances and so much more. He was born Patrick Charles Eugene Boone in 1934, an iconic, legendary, and beloved American singer, actor, composer, motivational speaker as well, sports team owner, record company head, TV station owner, radio personality, TV pitch man, author, songwriter, actor, TV host, and that's just all on Thursdays. <laughs> he really is incredible. He's also a family man, of course, and humanitarian and a man afraid to uh, celebrate life. And uh, of course, he was a, a teen idol who start really his star shined immediately, shot up really, really quickly, which was extraordinary because of his talent and his uh, wonderful zest for life. In addition to, of course, everything he's done, he also has a serious XM show, which and there he is in the studio. You want to check that out. There is the actual link. Yes. 50s gold. We're going to talk about that and so much more. We figured we'd start with something current and then we're going to bring you back in time as we celebrate this uh, true icon in American entertainment. There he is there. Of course, you may remember he also hosted the show on ABC, the Chevy show, which was another terrific groundbreaking uh, presentation. And also... Let me give you some numbers here as far as how many records he has sold. Well, of course, according to Billboard, second biggest charting artist of the 1950s behind only Elvis Presley, ranked number eight in the listing of the top 100 top 40 artists from 55 to 95 up to the 2010s. He held the Billboard record for, wow, spending 220 consecutive weeks on the charts with one or more songs each week which is absolutely extraordinary, gang. Truly an extraordinary accomplishment. There he is uh, today. He's going to be joining us from his wonderful home in just a second live. We're so happy, and we're doing it here on Valentine's Day, which is truly ironic and very, very special. Right now, Pat Boone, the number 10 all-time top recording artist, according to the Industry Bible Billboard, um, he has spent all these decades doing what he has loved. And I think that's something that's really special about uh, his life. At the age of 23, Pat began hosting the half-hour ABC variety television series, The Pat Boone Chevy Showroom, which aired 115 episodes from 1957 to 1960. Many musical performers, including uh, Edie Adams and uh, Andy Williams, Pearl Bailey, Johnny Mathis made appearances on the show. And his cover versions of rhythm and blues hits uh, were very noticeable and beloved as well. And as I mentioned, Elvis Presley, of course, right around the same time, but Elvis Presley was the opening act in 1955 for Pat Boone in Brooklyn, Ohio. As an author, he has penned a number of bestsellers as well. We're going to talk about a recent one here on the show called If, which is something very near and dear to his heart. He's also got uh, new music out. Yeah, he's still in the studio. He is still doing his thing. He did a recent um, duet with Crystal Gale, which is something quite special as well. Of course, you know, his lovely one of his lovely daughters is the incomparable performer, Debbie Boone. You light up my life and so much more. 
But again, he's been in this industry for so many years. He's worked with the Giants. He is one of the Giants as well. And in addition to all of that, he has a, he's been a man of true, deep faith and love. And of course, his love affair with his wonderful bride of some 68 years, Shirley. And um, it's, it's really a beautiful, beautiful love story. Uh, we just lost her just a couple of years back, but you never really lose somebody. She's in heaven. She's at the next juncture. And it's a beautiful place to be. And we're going to talk about this wonderful love affair that they've had and their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. It's amazing how he's also, in addition to all of that, a Columbia grad, Magnum Kulaud. It, it's amazing what he has done. He's always been on the go. Um, he's, he did college. He's done radio. He's done television, music, stage performances, toured the globe. I thought I was busy. <laughs> He's done it all. And we're just scratching the surface as we get ready to welcome him to the Jim Masters Show Live series. Truly one of the treasures in American entertainment in all facets of entertainment. And it's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure for me to welcome him to our series, the Jim Masters Show. Coming to us from his beautiful home where he says it's nice and sunny. Pat Boone on the Gym Masters Show. Pat, welcome to our program. It's a pleasure to have you here. You're like 10 Ralph Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that you uh, have compiled all of these facts, which are the only thing, a couple of things you might have missed was that. <laughs> of all of that. <laughs> yeah, out of all of that, I hold a record in the record business. Frank Sinatra recorded some 1,500 songs, all classics that as i estimate them i think we all do yeah. Bing Crosby, my early role model 2000 songs but yes. in the 70 years as you've mentioned i have recorded uh, an unprecedented and not not to ever be uh, matched uh, 2700 separate songs of <laughs> in many genres country rock pop patriotic gospel and jazz all these things. And, uh, and also uh, in the last about four years, I made the biggest deal in the history of Shark Tank. Uh, a car yes, that you on. did. And, uh, and yet the guy stiffed me. Robert, really? Robert Hershwick, the youngest of the sharks. We shook hands on a $5 million deal. Hand there you shaved. go there. There's Shark Tank. Yeah. yeah. Hey, great. Tell, Tell us about this. Well, it's just a cardboard cut out of, and, and not, a, not life size of the car that runs on compressed air, highly compressed air. It is a, it is a combustion, not a combustion, which is explosions of, uh, of fuel. It is a, a propulsion principle and it is highly compressed air, cylinder operated uh, and, and high pressure. And it, the fuel, as I told the sharks, the fuel is the most uh, readily available, environmentally perfect and inexpensive fuel there will ever be. Plus, it's reusable, infinitely, air. And it's a car that's already running, not just in automobiles in France, but even heavy duty, heavy machinery. And uh, I, I made the deal with Robert Hershevik. We shook hands and uh, five million to to be have a, ha half ownership of the first plant we were going to build in Hawaii to produce the first 2000 cars that Hawaii, because great place to test it. They no uh, no uh, people, nobody has to drive more than 30 miles in any direction. And you have a home in Hawaii too, right? I do on the big Island. Yeah. And so anyway, it was perfect. We shook hands. And then when the show ended, he went to dancing with the stars and, and his marriage broke up and he uh, married, I think the, dancing instructor, never called me, never gave me the courtesy of a phone call after making the biggest deal in the history of Shark Tank. So I'm busy and always am, but I've not given up on that. It is the future of car transportation, and it even can fly airplanes. That is compressed, highly compressed, and computer-controlled uh, propulsion of air. So that was one, that was another thing that uh, you might have missed also that I was the founding member of the ABA American basketball. That's right. Owned the Oakland Oaks. And we created the three point shot 
And I want to get with Steph Curry before too long while I'm still here and say, wait a minute, you owe me. <laughs> <laughs> we created the three-point shot in the ABA. And so, because I still yeah. play basketball myself in the uh, senior games until, until the last time was in the 80 to 85 bracket. Uh, it's three-on-three referee-controlled, uh, you know, uh, uh, half-court games. And uh, and and I played on the, a team from Virginia called the Virginia Creepers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, so I was even playing basketball and, until I was over 85. And I decided not to play in the 85 to 90 bracket, which was wise because yeah. I've broken my hip in the meantime. Wow. Anyway, so now it's, it's nice to have been visiting with you. I know we're out of time now. Right. <laughs> Just with the intro, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, now, a lot of people, of course, they associate you with, with Tennessee, but you were born in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida, right? Yep. You grew up in northern Florida. And then your parents moved to Tennessee, right? Tell us about that. I, I, I will. Daddy uh, was a uh, an architect, a trained uh, architect, but he he'd not uh, become an active architect yet. And he came to Nashville where his uncle Jack Boone uh, already had the Boone Contracting Company. So Daddy went to work with his uncle Jack. Uh, as an architect, and then became not only a building contractor himself, but eventually, with little help from me, thankfully, because of my career and all and the ability that I was given, uh, he wound up owning that company when the uh, the Uncle Jack retired, and the younger partners, junior partners, wanted to take control, but I was able to help Daddy. There was no uh, fight over it. I just was able to help provide the uh, uh, economic ability for him to become the uh, the owner of the Boone Contracting Company. And it built things like right now, Belmont College uh, in Nashville, which is a big movie school. And and, uh, and that he didn't build the whole university, but added to it. And he built homes and schools. And of course, my brother Nick and I, a year younger than I, our contribution to that was digging ditches and contra uh, on contracts of daddy's. And, and helping build churches and schools and pushing yeah. wheelbarrows full of concrete and and uh, and just being day laborers for which we earned dollar twenty five dollar dollar fifty an hour. And but he that, was a performer himself. Went by Nick Todd, right? And of course, the song at the Hop, another incredible one. He he had about twenty records. Yeah. The reason he was called Nick Todd was God bless him. He didn't want to uh, seeming to be. Um, profiting from the name Boone as my brother. So the head of Dot Records said, well, call yourself Nick Todd, which is Dot spelled backwards right? And, uh, with an extra T. And so Nick Todd had several hit records and everywhere he went, people wanted, had to, in, they did, he tried not to, but uh, but they kept introducing him as Pat Boone's brother, Nick Todd. Right, his so little brother, right. <laughs> he had to explain why it's Nick Todd if he's my younger brother. Right. <laughs> so music, of course, within their family uh, over the years, which I think is fantastic. And then you meet this lovely woman, Shirley Oley. Yeah. Tell us about when that came about and this wonderful love affair, one of the true romantic life stories, you know, ever. And certainly the long in the entertainment business, certainly. Yes. Usually lasts very long or, or remain between two people in the entertainment business. But no, I married Shirley Foley, the daughter of Red Foley, the great Hall of Fame country performer. That's right. Uh, when we were both 16, there's Red. Boy, you're quick on the trigger. We fair. are quick. Yeah, we he, do our research. <laughs> man, you did. And so anyway, she was, he, her, her mom, his dad, I'm sorry, her dad's mom, well, yeah. <laughs> No, his wife, Shirley's mom, had died of rheumatic fever and uh, and left him a widower. And he was taking his three girls, including Shirley, to uh, Springfield to start the Ozark Jubilee. Well, I, we were in Nashville. We were freshmen in college at 19. And, um, and he was taking her away. And I couldn't stand it. We'd been in love since we were 16, high school sweethearts. And, and so we met with him. I asked her first. And she said, yes, she was she wanted for us to do it 
and we ask him for his permission uh, to be married because I didn't ask my folks. They just said, "No, sir, you're not getting married till you're out of college," you know. And and so of course I could have done it anyway, but I didn't like defying my parents, so I didn't tell them about it till it had been done. But uh, we got married the next day, married by my high school principal principal who was also our friend and a minister and so he he married us because red was moving his other girls to uh springfield on, on monday this was saturday here she is kissing me when i came in from one of my trips mm. and you can see why we were always yeah. in love we never quit kissing like that no. in fact this, i think was two hours at the airport. right exactly <laughs> right exactly <laughs> It was truly uh, a, a match made in heaven on so many different uh, levels. And, you know, one of the beautiful things is sometimes the, the spouse or the partner doesn't handle well the notoriety and the attention yeah. that the person who's in the limelight, in the public eye, uh, deals with. But she was right there behind you. She understood well, you know yeah, because she was the daughter of an entertainer. She got she was, it. Been an entertainer's family, and Red Foley loved his wife and, and daughters, but he was gone about half the time, and he had um, uh, it, it was it was well enough known he had he was an alcoholic. We think coping with his depression, which was some kind of innate uh, something in in his system, and that's the way he coped with it. But he was a wonderful man, and she knew what it was like you know, for an entertainer to be gone a lot, traveling. And, and, and she, so she, when I, she and I married, we were, I was going to be a, an English teacher, teacher, right? Perhaps a preacher on Sundays and during the week, as many of my teachers were at the high school, the, uh, and college too, the uh, Christian college, David Lipscomb in Nashville. And that's when we married at 19, I loved singing, but I knew I couldn't, depend on a singing career so i was going to be settled down be a teacher and that was music to shirley's ears because she was did not want to be involved in entertainment she saw how hectic and and problematic it could be so now she was going to marry a settled teacher preacher when we were 19 but by the time we were 23 uh, I had gra I transferred to North Texas State. Then I made my first record while I was out there. My first records were million sellers. And by the time we were 23, I was doing the Pat Boone Chevy show. That's right. Television every week. I was having hit after hit record. I was now making movies for 20th Century Fox. And uh, we had uh, four girls, four kids, four daughters at age 23 when I graduated. People thought that must be what I was studying in school, husbandry or something. But no, it was <laughs> it was just we were two fertile people <laughs> and very much in love. And uh, and so we created God created through us these four beautiful women who now have given us the 16 grandkids and the 17 great grandkids. Mm. What was it like doing the uh, the show on ABC? You know, here you are a performer. But you're also a broadcaster. You're a host. You have this unbelievable radio and television background. And I know you've mentioned previously that, uh, which is why we like to do this show live because of my doing that professionally. There's something yeah. about the energy of live and anything can happen and the in interaction with the crew and the audience. And you had that opportunity on many occasions to do the Sirius XM show too, which we'll chat about. But this opportunity for this national exposure on television, what was that like for you? Well, it was heady. It was exciting. It was, uh, and I did, I just did not believe it would continue. I mean, even after I had some hit records and was doing the ABC television show, I stayed in college because I figured I'm still going to wind up looking for a teacher job when all this fizzles away. It wasn't going to last. This was my feeling. And yet it kept coming and kept getting bigger all the time. So when I graduated, Magna Cum Laude, as you said, with honors, I had to take some time out. I was on my way back down through Central Park after I took my last exam to to rehearse with Gina Lola Brigida, who was my guest on the show that week. And I said, wait a minute, I lay in the grass. <coughs> I lay in the grass. You say Gina Lola Brigida and you get all choked up. 
Yeah. I did. <laughs> <I'm excited there. laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so I lay in the grass wondering, wait a minute, am I going to apply for a teacher job? I've got this, te this uh, television contract, the movie contract, the recording contract. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess I better see where that goes before I apply for a job as an English teacher. So that never happened. But those were such hectic days. And I, I will say, Jim, that since I was considering it as temporary, mm. I was not looking at it as a full-time career. I did not think it would last. I'd already met a number of young uh, performers who were not young then, but had right. been young performers in the early days of their careers. But then I would see them performing in the bars, not when I'd go in for a restaurant that had a bar. And, uh, <laughs> And then there'd be somebody up there who'd had a couple of hit records and was now trying to earn a living uh, pursuing those records that he had when he was younger. And I thought, I can't bank on this as a career, not with four daughters now. No, right. And so uh, I just kept going. And uh, but when the movie career opened up and I kept making movies and then the records kept coming and and I wrote the book when I was still in college, Twixt 12 and 20, which That's was right. a book of advice for kids, teenagers, which I thought was in line with my intention to be a teacher. I'd be teaching English and also trying maybe a, a, on the side or as one of my other courses, teaching Bible. And that was, but now was an opportunity to address young kids and with what I did consider and was practical, but spiritual, biblical, uh, healthy advice for teenagers. And that book, Twix 12 and 20, became the number one nonfiction bestseller. Uh, it was only challenged by Art Linkletter's Kids Say the Darndest Things and Norman Vincent Peale's uh, Power of Positive Thinking. And then Pat Boone's Twix 12 and 20 were the number one bestsellers for two years. And all of this happened in such a heady rush mm -hmm. that I lived on excitement. But one thing I had learned from my early days in Nashville and radio and television live is how to be relaxed in the midst of sometimes chaos. Yes. Right. Things that go wrong live on the air. Mm -hmm. Dick Clark once on his blooper show showed me having to continue with the first few minutes of my Chevy show when the mic didn't operate. I was singing my opening song and, and attempt to get another microphone to me. They pulled the whole set down behind me. And I just stood there, you know, my mouth moving, hearing the background vocalist and the band going, but you couldn't hear me. And they went away to a commercial and they finally got a big, big uh, mic set up. And when we came back out, I just couldn't resist. And uh, I nearly gave the sound man a heart attack because when the red light came back on, I went. <laughs> he said, oh, no, that might yeah. be true. That's the humor. I, what I love about that is you took a situation that was chaotic and unpredictable and happening on the spot yeah. and you made humor out of it. And as opposed to sort of hiding it or you ran with it, which, which yeah. I've had happen too live on television and radio. And those are spectacular experiences, the adrenaline and, you know, everybody's banking on you to make it look good and keep it together. Yeah. It's keep really it fantastic unexpected things and even things that uh, are considered, you know, poor TV for things to go bad and people to fall or uh, uh, to get in a fight and get and walk off a show. There was the Academy Awards where the streaker went through and David Niven, as everybody was laughing, said, well, it's amazing to see someone so uh, ready to share his shortcomings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's got that's right. Naked is, guy ran past him on the Academy Awards. Is going clear across. <laughs> yeah, but now you, know, you, uh, you, you, uh, which some people may or may not know. I'm sure super, super intense fans do. I knew, and I think it's a beautiful thing you did. There are so many things for those who know Pat Boone just for the music and the movies and everything. He's also been somebody who's not only a humanitarian, but he takes a stance on things he believes in. And there was this opportunity where here you are with this network television show, the Chevy show on ABC network, big break. You're, you're knocking it out of the park, 
They love having you there. But then there were some opportunities to have folks like Harry Belafonte and others come on as guests. Mm -hmm. But there was a little bit of a turmoil behind the scenes about, no, we don't think we're going to do that. You yeah. said, look, then it's not my show if right. we can't bring anybody we want on. Tell us about that story, because that has really aided in a very positive way to uh, relations and, and so much more, which I think, and that was early to take a stance like that. Yeah, it was 58, 59, actually. And uh, I'd already had, you know, I was having rock and roll hits uh, and I'd bring Little Richard and Fats Domino and others on my show with me to sing the songs that we had both profited from that they wrote. And I recorded and had 10 times bigger records uh, in sales. But they benefited from, as Little Richard and Fats both admitted, they made more money from my records of their songs than from their own because I brought them out that were rhythm and blues or race music songs into pop and white, mainly white uh, television. And so they were on my show when we sang together, but Johnny Mathis and Sammy Davis and, and the Mills Brothers and so many black performers. And I was thrilled, Ella Fitzgerald, Nat King Cole, and, and to be able to perform with those fabulous entertainers. And, uh, and yet I didn't realize that Chevrolet in our third year was having a lot of problems down south. Remember, this was late 50s. Prejudice still very strong. And, and I was living out of range of it, I thought. But uh, when Harry Belafonte called me one afternoon and said, I've been watching your show. I like the way you treat your guests. And I knew there was a kind of a, a sub-meaning, uh, particularly your black performers. Would you like me to come on and uh, we can sing some songs together? And I said, would I? Of course, I was yeah. thrilled. And when I announced to our production meeting, with the Chevrolet people there and the network people that Harry Belafonte had called and was going to come on and our show free. And they looked at me in these sober looks. Oh no, it's not going to happen. I said, why? Well, then they said, we didn't, we were going to have to tell you, but it's toward the end of this third season, but Chevrolet is getting lots of complaints about the number of black performers we have on the show. And we cannot have Harry Belafonte. He's already very active in civil rights and, and, and uh, this might be the final straw with Chevrolet, our sponsor. And that's when I was stunned and, and a few minutes went by and they talked about other things until I had to inter interrupt. I said, wait a minute, this show is called the Pat Boone Chevy show, isn't it? Yes. I said, well, if, if Pat Boone has to say no to Harry Belafonte, the biggest performer in the world at that time, because of this, and he can't come on the show, I'm going to have to get you to get someone else to take the show from here. And they said, you're going to walk off your show. because I said, look, it's, I'm not just because of that. I grew up in the South. I'm a Nashville kid. But I'm not going to perpetuate this thing. And I'm not going to be part of it. So if I have to say no to Harry Belafonte, you have to say goodbye to me. And they said, well, and, then, you know, there was stuttering and some more talk and they finally said, look, if we have him come on, can you guarantee there will not be any subtle or any other kind of civil rights uh, statements or things done? Because uh, we'll lose our sponsor, Chevrolet. And I said, look, I can talk to Harry. I know he's a gentleman. And we can, just the fact that we're singing together and having a good time together as friends will be statement enough. I'm sure he'll agree. And I wish I could tell you it happened, but it didn't because it was the end of our third season and we had still about four shows to go. They were already booked. Harry had his other, uh, it would have been in the fourth year, but there never was a fourth year because I left the show and, uh, and went to specials instead. And you know, I never got to meet Harry. <laughs> he never knew why I didn't call him back and make the arrangements until uh, several years ago, I played golf with his daughter, Sherry. And uh, and told her about it. And she immediately after the golf game got on the phone. And we talked to Harry's wife and she he she, he never knew and neither had she mm -hmm. that I had left my own television show. But late, not long ago, um, oh, the guy that played uh, that played Ray Charles, the great actor, my gosh, that his name slipped for the moment. 
Um, Jamie Fox. Jamie Fox. We were. I was coming into the health club at, at dusk, and he was getting into an Escalade as I was leaving, and I didn't. I I had not seen him, but he saw me, and as I was Pat, and I said, "Yeah," and a voice came out of the car. Is that Pat Boone? I said, "Yes." He got out. He said, "Let me ask you something." We hadn't met. And he asked me if this story was true. And I said, yeah, but how did you know? I haven't talked about it. He said, I heard about it. When, when was that? I said, 1959. He said, well, for it to happen now would be nothing, no no big deal. But for 1959, for you to take that kind of a stance, can I hug you? <laughs> right. Jamie Foxx gave me a big That's hug. beautiful. Then later, Jesse Jackson, mm -hmm. after I recorded an album, of R&B classics with the original performers like Smokey Robinson and uh, mm -hmm. Sister Sledge and, and Four Tops and Earth, Wind and Fire and ended up with, with James Brown and this album of R&B classics of their hits with me singing with their songs with them. Hey, hey, Pat's got a brand new bag. When I say uh, Papa's got a brand new bag and I was being interviewed by, uh, by Santita Jackson Jesse's daughter on the air in the station in Chicago. And she said to the engineer, is that who I think it is on the phone? Put him on. That it was Jesse Jackson, her dad. And he said, you know, I've never said this publicly, but you know, we, we love Pat Boone. We know the stance he's taken for civil rights and, and with our performers and not just doing their songs, popularizing their music, but bringing them on his television show. And I think, Pat Boone did more for race relations with his music and his singing in the 50s than any other performer. Mm. Well, that's Jesse Jackson. I never said it, and I wouldn't, except that he has said it, and it's just a matter of record. And that's, I don't think that that's necessarily the case, although I do admit that some of the things I was doing just because I wanted to, and it seemed the right thing, and I enjoyed it so much, and because... You know, Ella Fitzgerald and Nat King Cole will come on and Count Basie and Sammy Davis perform with me. Uh, I was on, I was in high cotton, to use a Southern phrase, uh, to think that they would come on my show and treat me like an equal. Mm -hmm. and, and so those days, and one last thing you didn't know about, I'm sure, is uh, in 1960, because my career was hot in movies, records, I was approached by uh, people from South Africa, wanted me to come to uh, to South Africa and perform. And when I met with the agents, they were offering me a lot of money. I said, uh, let me ask you something. If I come to South Africa, I understand you have a policy. I didn't even know how to pronounce apartheid. But uh, I said, if, if black people want to come buy tickets and see me perform, they're not allowed. So, oh, don't worry about that. You'll have sellout crowds. And I said, no, no, you're, you're not getting my point. Uh, it, I'm not telling you how to run your country. We have problems still in our country. But if, if people who have a different skin or ethnicity or whatever want to come to hear me sing and they can't do it, then I'm not comfortable coming there. So I turned them down twice. But the third time they came behind closed doors, they said, if you'll give us your word as a gentleman, there'll be no publicity in this country about it. You won't talk about it. If you will come and do the 10 days or two weeks of concerts, the government will suspend the policy of apartheid for you for the time you're there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we won't announce it out publicly, but the word will go out that anybody who wants to buy a ticket without regard to their race or color can come to your shows, which they did. I had death threats in Durban and Pretoria, South Africa, because of the non-segregated audiences. But uh, we had police, special police in the audiences. <laughs> and uh, and I became a different kind of a performer, I will say. Up till then, I just stood at the microphone usually and just sang my songs. But in South Africa, I, I moved around the stage a, a good bit and even would kind of bob and weave once in a while. <laughs> right and watch for any glint of metal coming out of the uh, of the audience because the death threats were real, but they, they didn't happen. And uh, and yet, of course, it was 10 years before apartheid was lifted and no other entertainer that I know of ever had that experience of having them lift the curtain for me to come in and sing my shows. 
Where do you think that comes from? That has been something that has been tried and true through your entire life and continues to be uh, this, this understanding of humanity and what's right and doing the right thing and the moral ethical thing through all the craziness of these industries and, and being pulled here and do this and do that and accomplishing all that you've accomplished and continue to deep inside. Is it the faith? Is it the love of God? Is it the mm -hmm. setting initially by your family, your parents? What do you think you call upon to still be so steadfast about the things you truly believe in and you are there, you know, speaking and sharing and inspiring people along the way, Pat, all these years? Boy, that's a great question. And uh, as I think, I could think of eight or nine ways to answer. But but um, but my personal experience, first of all, with people of different colors and ethnicities, because of the my youthful experience as an entertainer, I mean, people that I greatly admired would come on my show and sing with me. And I felt privileged to be with Ella Fitzgerald and Nat mm -hmm. King Cole and they didn't have their own shows, but they would come on, on yeah. my shows. And then to, to make the music uh, that black performers were creating and, and my singing their songs was good for them and their music was great for me. But I also remember working for my dad as a laborer, uh, digging ditches and pouring concrete, pushing wheelbarrows and uh, working alongside for the same dollar and a half an hour that uh, some young high school uh, football players, black guys, they were making the same money and we were pushing the same wheelbarrows. And I was a laborer digging ditches and toting concrete, uh, to toting lumber. And, uh, and and we were, I noticed that they could outwork me in many cases. They were strong, young athletes, but I kept up with them and wanted to try to match them. Even though I was the boss's son, I wanted to match them with their efforts. My mom, she, we couldn't afford my early days, uh, except a cleaning lady came in once a week, a black lady, and she and mama were good friends. I saw that. That's the way we knew her. Her name was Hilda. And, uh, and I came home from school one afternoon. I heard this laughing and some kind of something going on in the basement, which was an unfinished basement, but it's where mama had her washing machine. And I went down to see what was happening. And they were having a suds fight. She and the, and the and Hilda, because <laughs> one, one of the other splattered suds on the other, and so they started swapping this full of you know hands fulls of water, <laughs> flashing water, and they were just having fun. Now when when that was over, Daddy, as usual, when the day's work was done, he put Hilda in the car and took her to the other part of town, so she didn't have to ride the bus. And, uh, and it'd be dark after she got home or before she got home. So, I mean, those life experiences. And then, of course, you get in the entertainment business. And, and even by the time I came along, half the people who were, you know, holding up the whole entertainment business were, were black folks. And, uh, and so I, I was just honored to be alongside them and to get to know them and to be friends. And I, I, and, and I, when they were in any way, I, I remember, uh, I think it was uh, George Shearing. Let me see. I think it was George Shearing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, George Shearing, the, the black pianist, great jazz pianist, told me when he was on my show that we, when he was in the South, when the prejudice was still so rife, he said he was performing in a club in Atlanta. And uh, he took a break and uh, he was sitting over on the side waiting resting and a patron came up and said mr shearing yes yes how are you and said uh, you've been have you been blind your whole life? yes yes i have why he said uh, has anyone told you that your drummer is black no has anyone told you that your drummer is colored mm. and shearing said oh really what color right <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh i mean for them to tell yeah. me these jokes and for me to yeah. be able to laugh along with them, they knew I would see the humor. Now, uh, b before even um, your own show, you were a regular performer on Arthur Godfrey and his friends from 55 to 57. What was it like working with Arthur Godfrey? It was a treat, a real treat. Now, he was a taskmaster. He was 
Uh, I mean, he, he was very genial and, and, and a good guy, but you know, he, he called the shots and you had to, to be there always and be ready to go, not just with your songs, but hopefully something interesting to talk about. In my case, so often when I came into my early days, I was telling him about a new baby we were expecting. Again, another one? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he could have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Um, but but he, uh, he was giving me an opportunity. While I was in college, I would get through with my show and I'd go up, take a subway up to uh, – up to the 150th street or wherever it was 145th to Columbia university and then come back in. And he, he thought that was really good that I was pursuing my college career, even though I was having hit records and that's why I was on his show. And, um, when I graduated, he gave me a beautiful painting uh, that I have in my wall in the other room here now and a watch, a beautiful watch and on the back engraved to Pat Boone for cumin Lauda. Uh, that is, I was, he knew I graduated from Magda Cum Laude. But he, he was very good and very supportive and appreciative of the fact that I came in ready for every show. I knew my songs. I had something to bring up and we could talk about. And, uh, and I gave him things to make fun of, you know, even my white buck shoes and my, my youth and my college and having babies so fast and mm -hmm. four babies in quite a little bit less than four years by the time i by the time i left his show no no i'd already begun my own show and oh and when i got a uh, offer to come to hollywood and uh, and make a do a, a movie test just a screen test and uh, i went and asked him if i could take the a couple of weeks off to go do this and he said go ahead boy and said if something comes of it good if not come on back and will save your place. So he uh, he had fired Julius La Rosa. I don't know if you remember that. I'm sure, yeah. Time, I expect. Mm -hmm. but he took the took it too lightly that he had that 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 kind of opportunity on the Godfrey Show because he had a couple of hit records and then would show up, not show up on Mondays mm -hmm. because he'd been out doing weekend uh, dates and making money, and he'd call in sick, and Arthur Godfrey knew what was happening, so. He fired him on the air. He had hired him on the air off a Navy ship when he first heard him sing. And now when uh, Julius LaRosa, and he admitted later this was a fact, when he saw he was taking his opportunity too lightly, he, uh, he said, Julie, you sang your last song here today, son. It's been nice having you. And <laughs> this was a big, big surprise to Julius LaRosa and his audience. And and in fact, it was it was uh, it was not good for Arthur Godfrey because people had come to love Julius La Rosa, and it seemed cruel to them that Arthur fired him on the on the show, and just said, "Well, good luck to you. You're doing well, and we wish you well. So goodbye." And uh, and then I replaced him. <laughs> so I took, it, I took it very seriously. Yeah, you dove right in. In 59, now some folks might not know this, your likeness was licensed to DC Comics, first appearing in Superman's Girlfriend, Lois Lane, before starring in your own series from the publisher, which lasted five issues from 59 to 60. That's kind of cool too, huh? How in the world did you know this? Boy, you. I tell you. You are a Ralph Edwards. You, you <laughs> really done your, your job. I, uh, well, they came to me. I, uh, I'm, I was a comic book fan. I wish I had saved all the comic books that I used to collect all the time, and I didn't. But uh, but but I was very aware of their success, and so the, some of the uh, uh, writers of that show and The Simpsons were Christians, and they knew I was a Christian guy, and I was in church every Sunday, and and I'd written a book of advice for teenagers that was strongly. Uh, Christian flavored because that's who I am and, and the kind of advice I would give. But uh, so they, they came up with uh, uh, stories that could feature me. And I must say the, I was something of a cartoonist myself in high school, did cartoons for the high school paper and, and drew things. So I really respected their ability with just a few strokes of a pen, uh, create something that looked like somebody. 
and uh, and they made people look like me. I was on the cover of those magazines with Superman, and I've so suddenly, I supposedly, come up with a song that had some kind of national secret in it. <laughs> And, and he Superman had to come to make sure I didn't sing that song, <laughs> and uh, and it took Superman to keep me from doing it. But then uh, with Lois Lane and The Simpsons, I went. Uh, I was uh, a guy who went on an outing with the Simpson family, and they had a, a Ouija board with them. And as they had the Ouija board, mm -hmm. in fact, I I helped with the storyline of this this episode and. Um, and then as they were conjuring with the Ouija board up came some spirits, some evil spirits, and they were going to take over everything. They came riding in on motorcycles, demonic people. And, um, oh, and I was, oh, I remember I was not with them. I was camping nearby and I heard about it. And I came riding in on my motorcycle and uh, with the sign of the cross and made them leave. And uh, I mean that sounds foolish now to talk about it, but it was in the uh, it was in the Simpsons comic book. Yeah, didn't you travel also to Italy, and you had your eye on buying a Super America sports car, but Enzo Ferrari sort of dissuaded you from doing that because he said that that car wouldn't have enough room for your four daughters, so he sold you a four door Ferrari two by two instead. I don't know how in this world you knew that because, you know, I just, <laughs> I don't have many of the opportunities to talk about it, but yeah, I'm the only guy I've ever met or known of who took, got a, a, a demonstration drive from Enzo Ferrari himself, but I was appearing there in concert and I wanted to buy a super America, which was a racing car, uh, you know, street designed, but it was really a, a really racy, fancy Ferrari but for street use. And I wanted to buy that. So I made arrangements to come to Modena where the plant is, where he was. When they learned I was coming, it was the middle of the day. They said, would you like to have lunch with Mr. Ferrari? I said, well, of course I would. So we were having lunch and he showed me up in the upper floor of his, the, <clears throat> the big spread out building where he had all the designs of cars yet to come and uh, and they brought us up a nice lunch and we were sit eating it. I said, you have children? I said, yes, Mr. Ferrari, I have four boys and girls. I said, uh, well, two, all girls, actually. You have four, four girls, four daughters? I said, yes. He said, then you don't want Super America. You want my two plus two. And I said, Mr. Ferrari, the car is not for my daughters, it's for me. Oh, but you have, I take you for the drive. I'm doing my Enzo Ferrari imitation. <laughs> <laughs> and he put me in a four door, what looked like a, 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 it was a sedan. Mm -hmm. a sedan. Right. And he took me for a drive, Enzo himself driving with the mm -hmm. gears and, and gearing down, going around curves, scattering goats and cows and people out of the way and yeah. curving mountain roads and put the car through its paces. It was still a racing kind of Ferrari. Yeah didn't look like the super America. And he brought me back breathless to the, to the building, the design building. And, and he sold me a car. I didn't want, I, I, I wanted the super America. Instead, I brought, I bought the two plus two <laughs> and because of the salesmanship of Mr. Ferrari himself. And how could you say, no, there's a picture somewhere and I've seen it. And if I'd known we were going to talk about it, I would try yeah. to, there's a picture of him showing me, the wow. Super America that I had come to buy. Yeah. But when he found out I had four daughters, he said, "Oh no, no, you need the you need the two plus two. Yes. And and so that is what I bought. Now I sold it eventually to Tommy Smothers of the Smothers Brothers. That's right. After I had put in two air horns that could play ba 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 April love ba 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 took two air horns to play that <laughs> and that, even that didn't make up for the fact it still looked like I thought like a Corvair <laughs> and so Tommy Smothers bought it and every now and then over the next couple of years I would hear going by ba 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 and that <laughs> there goes Tommy in my Ferrari and the Ferrari. <laughs> Somebody else, of course, uh, you know, is a beloved uh, figure in entertainment and music that you had an opportunity to 
to work with and and you were the the two of you are the biggest names at the time, the incomparable Elvis Presley. Yeah. Tell us about the relationship with Elvis Presley and in working with him. I love that picture you have there now with him and yeah. Julia Krause. And uh, my manager, Jack Spina, behind me, we were making movies at that point in adjacent sets at 20th Century Fox, movie after movie and record after record, but we met the first time when he'd only recorded one song uh, on Sun Records, and it was a bluegrass song by, by Monroe, uh, Bill Monroe. Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. Well, he tried to make that sound like rhythm and blues, but it wasn't, and it, it was a weird, if you hear it today, it was <laughs> a strange sounding record that he tried to do his Presley magic, which was not well formed yet. I mean, he hadn't done any other records except that one record. But on the other side, after he and I performed on the sock hop, that Bill Randall, who was the nation's new number one DJ at WERE in Cleveland, uh, had put together, it was a sock hop. And in those days, the sock hop consisted of the DJ playing the record, which the kids already had heard on his show, but then they danced to it uh, and or sometimes if he just was going to play records and have a performer or two come, the performer couldn't recreate, in most cases, their own record. They didn't have the musicians to do that. So they just play the record and we would lip sync our record or play the guitar, you know, play the guitar, but, but you were hearing the record. So it's, it was a sock hop. And I'd committed to come in from New York where Shirley and I were expecting our second baby and I had just enrolled at Columbia University, but I knew that I owed Bill Randall a lot because he had helped me by making my records of, of R&B songs, pop hits. So of course I went in to do it for him. And when I got there, he met me at the airport. He said, we got a new kid coming up from Shreveport tonight to come on ahead of you. Uh, I said, guy had been signed by RCA Victor. I said, "Is it? who is it? Have I ever heard of him? He said, no, you, you wouldn't have heard of Elvis Presley. I said, I did. I've heard of him on a, a country jukebox in Dallas. And I said, but Bill, he's he's a hillbilly. <laughs> you know, that's that's country music. I thought we were doing rock and roll. He said, well, uh, RCA thinks they've got something. I want to hear him tonight and see what he looks like. And they're excited about him. I said, well, I'd, I'd like to meet him, too. So I was backstage at, at Cleveland High School. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was... Uh, Brooklyn High School in Brooklyn, Cleveland, Ohio, yeah, Brooklyn in Cleveland, Ohio, and I don't know why they call it Brooklyn High School, but there it was. And I was backstage waiting to lip sync my three records I had recorded since March of that year. This was October, and all three of my first records had become million sellers. Boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. now Elvis came on, and nobody knew who he was. And he came in, "Hi, Elvis, Pat Boone. Nice to meet you." He was very shy seeming, and shook his hand and, and I said, uh, Bill Randall thinks maybe some big things ahead for you. I don't know, but I hope so. And he just leaned back against the wall and, and Larry Black and others, the two guys closed in around him. And I tell you, he, he didn't want to keep talking. So I waited and he went on. Bill Randall said to the kids about, I don't know, close to a thousand kids. And, and somewhere there's a film of this. Nobody knows whatever happened to it, but they were taping it for uh, I think it was, uh, I forget which film company, but uh, it was the day in the life of the Pied Piper of Cleveland. It was, it was featuring Bill Randall, but it happened that Elvis and I came on the show that night. And, uh, and so uh, he said, now you kids don't know this young man, but RCA Victor thinks they have some a hot commodity. So let's give a warm welcome to Elvis Presley. So Elvis came out and he lip synced, Blue Moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. And I could look through the curtain and I wasn't impressed with the way it sounded, but the kids liked the way he looked. And he wasn't twitching around and, you know, not doing gyrations around the stage. He was, he was lip syncing, his not lip sync, guitar syncing uh, his guitar. And then the other two guys, bass and, uh, and other guitar, doing then that song. When he finished, he said, thank you very much. I'd like to do that side of that record for you. Hope you like it. And it was, that's all right, mama. That's all right with me. And that was rhythm and blues. I recognized that right away. 
And I liked that. And so did the kids. But and they were getting excited now and they wanted more. But that's all he had. So he left. And then I went on because I had the hit records at the moment. Later, about two years later, we were renting homes in, in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were visiting back and forth, two Tennessee boys, me, Nashville, him, Memphis. And um, I said, almost that first night we met in Cleveland, you seem very shy. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I didn't know how to talk to you. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you were a star. I said, a star? I've been just, I hadn't been recording just since March of that year. Yeah, but you had three hit records. I didn't know how to talk to you. And it just showed that he was, he was a bashful young guy, except on stage. And on stage, right. the audience let him know right away he was welcome. But even the rest of his life, he was always surrounded by his 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 band, his boys. Mm -hmm. Even Priscilla told me when they were married and where, where it was Graceland or Palm Springs, she felt like she was living in a boy's dorm all the time. Right. The guys were always there, which was not conducive, actually, to the... <laughs> To their marriage neither was the travel and all that so we know what happened in the sadness in his life but didn't smile very much in the photos either over the years right well yeah i've talked about that too because uh somebody told him an actor said you know you're going to be posing for a lot of pictures don't do smiling pictures always look serious if you want them to take you seriously as an actor look serious when you take the pictures so it was always you know half sullen or just not smiling you don't ever you hardly ever see except spontaneous shots. spontaneous he didn't right. know he was being taken but if that's a nice knew, shot there yeah now see he and i are in, in uh, memphis at the airport and this was about a month before he died mm -hmm. but we didn't know that was going to happen of course but uh I, he and his buddies were coming into the airport at the same time i was there off to off to my to, to the right of the picture are my wife and four girls and and they all knew him he used to visit us in our backyard when the girls were swimming and they when they were little kids they'd jump out and jump on him and and, and i say stop that girls you're getting him all wet leave him alone man i like it right <laughs> which he did he wanted what we had a wife yeah. i wanted a wife he he wanted a wife and kids mm -hmm. like had. and so he'd come visit with me so now he was there headed to uh, back to the uh, Hilton. And uh, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Orlando. I was going to go there for a Tupperware convention in a big, <laughs> a big auditorium. And he said, well, that's the wrong way, man. And he yeah. turned to his buddies behind me and said, he's always going the wrong way. Mm. And I said, well, Elvis, it depends on where you're coming from. Yeah. It's the last thing that we said to each other, <laughs> he's going the wrong way. And I said that, well, it depends on where you're coming from. And we parted, dear friends, as we were two, Nash, two Tennessee boys who followed each other's careers very closely, friendly competitors. And there we were in the movie studio. And uh, I was filming, I think, um, a film called uh, All Hands on Deck. Yes, right. Eden and, and, uh, and, a, and a big musical. And he was doing some other, I don't know, one of the cheaper films that Colonel Tom Parker put him into. Yeah, they were just really quick, well, quickly made films that were not, they were light on story. Mm -hmm. I was lucky in that the films I made generally, like uh, State Fair, which was a Broadway show, and Richard Rogers wrote a song, a new song for me to sing in that, uh, mm -hmm. in that one, Willing and Eager, I sang with Anne Margaret. Yes, and, that was uh, going to be my next thought. Anne Margaret was just a recent guest on our show, and she talked ooh. about State Fair, and and so much more and uh there you yeah. guys saw what was it like working with the incomparable and margaret of which you still stay in touch with your friends yeah, she was a guest she, on your sirius xm show this is fantastic you have these pictures mm -hmm. yeah and margaret gosh she was i when i first met her they were grooming her at uh, 20th to be uh the next bridget bardot or the next marilyn monroe and she was just a, a nice, talented young girl from from Illinois, off the farm, and I knew her as Anne Margaret Olson, right. and so to me, she was just a nice young girl, and she was 
too old to be one of my own daughters. I mean, we were almost the same age, but, uh, but I just, my attitude toward her was not, she was a sex queen, but she was a nice girl and I wanted to see her get along well. Now, of course I did, uh, I did my first real kissing scene with her. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I had turned down kissing Shirley Jones in my second movie only because it wasn't in the script. And I had not talked to my own wife, Shirley, about me doing kissing scenes in movies. This, this all was happening so fast in my life. <laughs> and I, here I am, I got a seven year movie deal. I'm making my second movie. It's the first time I'm asked by the director to kiss the leading lady. And I asked him if I could put it off to later in the film uh, because I hadn't talked to my own wife yet about how she would feel about me spending a half a day kissing our friend Shirley Jones. And um, when when I came back to the studio ready to go, because I'd had the conversation with Shirley, my wife, and, and uh, she said, look, I'm ahead of you. I know if you're going to make movies, there's going to be kissing. Just promise me one thing. And I said, anything. She said, you won't enjoy it. <laughs> and I said, okay, I promise I won't enjoy it. So I came back puckered up, ready to kiss Shirley Jones, but they had changed, you know, the, the calling for that, changed the scene to later in the film. Meanwhile, the studio was flooded with mail and telegrams from all over the country. Stand, stick to your guns, boy. At last, there's some kid with uh, morals in the movies and, you know, complimenting me on not kissing my leading lady because I was married. Well, I knew that was not going to last, and that was the 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 stories that were printed were guessing that it was for religious reasons. It wasn't. It was just, I wanted to stay married. That's all. And when I got Shirley Boone's permission, I came back ready uh, and anticipatory, really, of uh, but you know, promising not to enjoy it too much. But I never kissed Shirley Jones in a movie because of the mail that kept coming in congratulating me on taking a stand, which really I hadn't taken for, for mm. reasons that were not the right reason. Right. And I didn't kiss her, but I did some kissing scenes with Anne Margaret, Debbie Reynolds, Diane Baker, Barbara Eden and others. And, uh, and, and, uh, and of course I won't say I didn't enjoy them, but I tried to uh, make it minimal. Right. <laughs> right. Even, with, <laughs> even with Anne Margaret, though it was a real good movie smooch yeah. with her in state fair. And like I said, you stay friends with her today, and she was on your show recently, huh? And we just did her. Yes, she was on my Sirius XM uh, uh, 50s Gold, Pat Boone, eight, eight times a week on Sirius XM, talking about all the music of the 50s. And, and Anne came in, and she knows I just call her Anne all the time, uh, always did. And so yeah. here we are, hugging again, though we weren't kissing, but we, <laughs> did, we did a movie in her latest album. I don't know if you know about it. It's on Cleopatra Records. Mm -hmm. You know about it? It's it's a song. yeah. Tell tell our uh, listener or viewers in case they don't know. It's Teach Me Tonight. Now that did you say I've got a lot to learn? Well, don't think I'm trying not to learn. Since this is the perfect spot to learn, keep teach me tonight. And she'd already recorded her part of of this duet, uh, but had not gotten anybody to sing it with her yet. It was an album of duets with other people. And so this was only about a year ago. And so she asked if I would do the, uh, through an intermediary, really uh, an agent, would I be interested in doing the song with her? I didn't know what the song was, but would I do a duet with her? I said, sure. And Margaret, yeah, of course. Well, then they send me the track. She's already recorded the music and her voice. Did you take, uh, did you say I've got a lot to learn? And so I, I thought, wait a minute, we are both 80 years old and we're singing a song and she's wanted me to teach her tonight. What? Teach me what? <laughs> and so I just couldn't take it as seriously as, yeah. as she thought I would. And I was afraid she would be offended. She wasn't. She's no. got a sense of humor, too. So she, if you hear the record, you'll hear her sing coachingly. Did you say, I've got a lot to learn? And I said, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. <laughs> so don't think I'm trying not to learn since this is the perfect spot to learn. Teach mm -hmm. me. I said, well, what do you have in mind? Right. I, didn't sing it. I didn't sing it. Uh, uh, starting with the ABC of it, I said, oh, you're going to go right to the beginning. Uh, right down to the XYZ of it. And I, oh, we're going, you're going to take the whole course. Um, 
and I forget what the next line, da 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 teach me tonight. And then we sang the rest of it and I harmonized with her. And uh, and uh, it turned out really well. And in the over the instrumental chorus with guitar, I said, and I was whistling too, because I always like to have excuses to whistle on my records. And so this was a case where I could whistle as if I was standing around waiting to, to teach uh, Ann Margaret the next course. And, uh, and so I whistled and then I, and I said, you know, I think we've just come up with a great octogenarian love song, octogenarian love song. <laughs> and they left it in the record and she thought it was funny and left it in too. And they tell me that this is, if not the most played or uh, at least one of the most played records and in the beginning now of, of <clears throat> this album of hers with other artists and they were doing rock songs and kind of stuff like, you know, from, uh, uh, from the uh, Las Vegas movies and so on that she made. But this was really just a humorous friendship kind of a song that we did yeah. together. Which is incredible. That's, I mean, great memories. And talking about music and albums, of course, you, as we mentioned, the numbers are extraordinary as far as how many uh, people have purchased the albums and have loved the albums. And you've left this and continue to leave this indelible mark on, on all of us, but some of the iconic songs, Love Letters in the Sand, mm -hmm. One Right, yeah, huh? And of course, that was written uh, for me by a couple of Academy Award writers, Sammy Fain, Paul Francis Webster. And no, wait a minute, that's April Love. I'm getting it, April Love was that. But Love Letters in the Sand was, was from a poem by a guy who had a, a newspaper column, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think of his name at the moment, but he wrote the, uh, the, he wrote a poem and then somebody else said it to music. Bing Crosby had recorded it, but it had not been a hit. Now, most everything Bing Crosby did, uh, you know, became a hit. And he had some 41 number one records in his career. Almost everything he made went to number one. And he had recorded that song. And when Randy Wood of Dot Records liked it, um, and he knew that it was a good song. I had to come up with something in my first movie, Bernadine. Uh, there were no love interest things in that, and but and we had already love letters in the sand chosen. But uh, no, no, we had Bernadine. That was Johnny Mercer. I'm confusing two films. You've you've surprised me by knowing more about my career than than I have almost forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, because I'm here to teach you tonight. <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't think I'm trying not to learn since this is the perfect spot to learn. Teach That's me some good. more. Anyway, the film Bernadine Johnny Mercer wrote the title tune and uh, we needed another song in it. And so, Randy, why don't you sing that song, Love Letters in the Sand? But it had nothing to do with the movie. There was no love interest in the film. And I just uh, leaned back against uh, the wall in this teenage hangout where I was alone now. And I just like uh, nostalgically sang this song, Love Letters in the Sand, and whistled in it as well. And that record, when it came out, went to number one. It was the B-side of right. Ernest. Johnny right. Mercer was thrilled, really, because he got a great royalty from... Bernadine was a hit anyway because of my career happening then. Mm -hmm. But the other side, the B-side, was Love Letters in the Sand. And he got a lot of royalty for his song, Bernadine, as a result of my love letters in the sand on the other side yeah. of that. And that record, uh, last I heard it sold some six million singles and that's singles, yeah, many albums. And uh, one crazy thing about my music, which I consider crazy, is that I've had many, many hit records. Yeah. And nobody does, other artists never do any of my songs. It's an interesting thing because once a song is becoming a hit by anybody, uh, other people, other artists eventually will want to do their versions of, of that song. And you're a songwriter too. Um, yeah. Why, why do you think it is that they don't do the versions of yours? Do they just feel that you, it would be hard to match or rearrange what you've accomplished initially? Pat? Well, those are good ideas. I think the, uh, 
the one thing is that I did the song the way it was meant to be sung. And I don't know, I did, <laughs> when I did a heavy metal album, a guy in Chicago called Man Cow had somebody make, as I was doing, um, uh, uh, I was doing more pop versions, that big band jazz versions of heavy metal songs. He did Yes, you were. <laughs> and have somebody do a heavy metal version of Love Letters in the Sand. Well, uh, of course, the song didn't fit it at all. And so it's hard to, if you've done the song the best way that it can be done, it's hard for somebody else to, to do it. Plus, yeah. uh, if it's really totally identified with you. Yes. No, when I when I did Ain't That a Shame, it was already a big hit for Fats Domino. Uh, but uh, when uh, Cheap Trick did it, uh, they did it at a uh, live at the Budokan in Japan. Uh, they weren't they they were not mimicking me or imitating or doing Pat Boone's version of Ain't That a Shame, but Fats Domino's version, even though it didn't sound like either one. But but those are the the, the two reasons I think. If the song is to too totally identified with uh, one artist, I don't think anybody's going to do a Taylor Swift song anytime soon. Uh, you know, if it's totally identified with her, and many people did some of Elvis's songs, but not many. Um, right. I did. I did a whole album. I don't know if you know about my Guess Who album, where mm -hmm. I did an album of uh, of his songs. Did you Did you know about that at all? I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. I I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was oh Pat Boone sings Guess Who, right? Colonel Tom Parker, when he heard I was doing it, this was all Elvis's hits done my way with light, very commercial jazz treatments. Because if you're going to do it, you're not going to try to do it the same way. And I, I, I liked I, they lent themselves. I felt to light commercial jazz treatments. And so when Tom Parker heard about it, he said, "Well, that that's good. I'll tell the boys, and I, I know he'll be happy to hear it. But now we got to talk about royalty." And I said, well, you're going to get lots of royalty, Colonel, because you guys own most of the songs. And and you've got Al Elvis listed as co-writer on some of them. And I bet that came as a big surprise to the other writers who didn't know until, <laughs> until, they, <laughs> until they saw the album that Elvis supposedly co-wrote some of them. And he laughed. He knew, he knew I knew he was the snowman, the hustler. And he said, no, I mean the royalty for the use of his name, because I was going to call it Pat Boone Sings Elvis. And if you use Elvis's name, he says, you got to pay a royalty. I said, well, uh, it's a tribute to him. Yeah, but you put his name on it. And he says, you know, we're friends, but business is business. And so when I told Randy Wood to Dot Records that, he got really upset. We were scrap it. We're not going to do it. We're not going to pay uh, Elvis or Tom Parker any royalty for the use of his name when this is a tribute to him. And we're doing the songs they own anyway. And I said, let's just call it something else. Well, what else can we call it? So I came up with the idea of calling it Pat Sings Guess Who. Pat Boone Sings Guess Who. And then on, and I had a painting made of me in a gold lame suit with a guitar pose. And, um, and then on the sides, on either side of me, all the titles, Love Me Tender, Hound Dog, Don't Be Cruel, Wear My Ring Around Your Neck. And, uh, and so, of course, you knew looking at the songs who Guess Who was. Well, on the back liner note of the LP, it was just an LP in, the, in that time, I wrote the back liner notes about my friend Guess Hoosley. And I made believe that I was singing the songs of Guess Hoosley since I called it Pat Boone Sings Guess Who. And so Tom Parker sent me a gold-plated membership card in his little-known Snowmen's League club he had created for other people who he considered snowmen. That is people who hustled and, and who talked other people into doing things and who made things really successful just through their marketing expertise. And he realized that I had hustled the hustler, that I got around Tom Parker by not mentioning Elvis and yet I got the record out the way I wanted to do it. And so he sent me, <laughs> we were friends and he, and, and really, tipping his hat to me, his derby to me, he, he sent, made me a membership, a member in good standing of Colonel Tom Parker's Snowmen's League, Chief High Potentate Colonel Tom Parker, member in good standing, Pat Boone. And that is a, that is a treasure to me, that, uh, 
membership in his snowman's league. You know, in the movie, he called uh, uh, Tom Hanks. I, I didn't really buy Tom Hanks. I liked him and everything else he ever did, but I knew Tom Parker. And though he captured a lot of the, of the um, working person, Tom Parker, he didn't, he didn't capture him. He gave him a, a Scandinavian accent. Uh, and Tom Parker didn't talk. He was a real Southerner, the way he talked. I don't know who told Tom that Colonel Tom Parker had some kind of a, you know, it was a Dutch, Dutch accent. Mm -hmm. Scandinavian Dutch. But he, you know, he he was a real Southerner, and uh, and we got along great because he knew that I respected him. We were we were we were both from Tennessee at that point, and, uh, and he knew I respected him, and and he respected what I was doing without a manager like Tom Parker. That's incredible, and look what we dug up. Yeah, <laughs> we are. Hey, that's incredible. <laughs> Not that. Yeah, now you see all our songs too. Yeah, all the songs I love. You know, I'm really proud of my. In fact, Elvis let me know how much he thought of this album and the way he said early in his career when yeah. he asked him, what other singers do you like, male singers. He said, well, Pat Boone. He said he sings ballads better than anybody. And uh, so there I am with "Love Me," uh, all shook up, merengue, <laughs> and we're at one night with you. And then uh, I do um, Hound Dog uh, as if it were a Elizabethan minuet at first. Paul uh, Smith, a great pianist. We have fun with it. And then Heartbreak Hotel and Love Me Tender. I do think that, uh, that I rivaled my buddy. I'd not say nobody was ever going to do them better. But even Elvis let me know that he felt I was doing them as well yeah. in the way as he did them. Yeah, and that's, that's enough for me. That's incredible, really, huh? Yeah. April Love, you mentioned this one earlier as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was by Paul Francis Webster, Sammy Fain, and two Academy Award writers. And here I am, my only second movie. I'm 20, 22, I think, at that point. Maybe 20, 22, really. And, um, and they, these two Shirley Academy Jones, writers, yeah. Shirley Jones, and they play me the song, Sammy Fain had sat at the piano, and they sang me the song and it was beautiful. And I could tell it was a beautiful song, but I said, fellas, you know, forgive me, uh, this is a terrific song, but I know you want a hit record. And I think, I said, this is rock and roll time, isn't it? And and they said, yeah, but this is a beautiful ballad. And it's a beautiful, you know, beautiful, you love, it's a movie with a love story in it. I said, well, can we try to make it a little more exciting in some way? Um, and they said, like what? I said, well, I what occurs to me is given an exciting sort of intro, like pop, 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 da, da, da. And and they so it sounds like something important's about to happen. And uh and sure enough, we said, well, we can do that. So that's the way we introduced the record was pop 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 April love is for the very young. And um, and now uh, Connie Francis, uh, bless her heart, she took that very thing and and used it. So she's her record was pop 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 where the boys are. That's <laughs> right. The very same intro, but uh, that was fine. You can we can borrow anything from each other. From each <laughs> other, yeah. Like Here's another. Said, I almost lost my mind. That was Ivory Joe Hunter. Yeah. And it was a big blues hit. And here I was. I don't know why I had an affinity for blues. Yeah. But I love singing blues. I love the blues singers themselves. And so here I was singing blues. Because I almost lost my mind. And not every singer can do that. That's an octave jump. I almost lost my mind. Bobby Darren did it once on one of his records. I forget what it was called, but just to to imitate this as he was imitating me, I thought he did it so well when I was driving down the uh, the East Side Highway in New York on my way to the Godfrey show. I heard this record come on, and I thought, when did I record that? Oh, 
Bobby did such a good job of imitating me that I thought it was me and I just didn't remember doing the song. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, just finding the blues, I even did uh, a famous blues singer, uh, uh, Jimmy Reed, mm. uh, terrific blues singer. And I did a song as, oh, well, I'm going to New York, get on the TV quiz show. Try to win myself some more of that dough. Well, I'm going to New York. Yeah, I'm going to New York. I'm going if I have to walk. And I always look for records where I had low notes. Yeah. And I, I could have pitched that a little higher. It would have been better. <laughs> you know, it's so amazing. As we're talking about all these different things that you've been involved in, every aspect of the industry and giving back as you do throughout it all, uh, 12 iconic movies in Hollywood as well. Journey to the center of the earth. Yeah. James Mason. That's Which another. I, I tried to turn it down. I didn't want to Did do you? it because I, I wanted to see, I, I saw myself naive as I was as a young Bing Crosby. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I was singing rock and roll songs, but I wanted, as far as movies were concerned, to be that uh, easygoing young guy and do love songs and and uh, and do uh, light movie musicals. And um, now this 20th Century Fox wanted me to do a Jules Verne science fiction film, and I I didn't want to do it, and they kept persuading me, and finally. Through my manager, they they gave me a, a they committed a percentage of the profits after re, after uh, uh, receiving the uh, you know after recouping is the word I was looking for for after recouping the uh, money that they spent on the film which was very expensive at that time a few million dollars they spent on the film and it was not likely that they were ever going to that it was ever going to make money or any profits. And, and we knew, too, that movie companies notoriously had two sets of books that they kept. So <laughs> it wasn't much of a of a lure for me to do a science fiction film. But they talked me into it. They said, we'll put some songs in it. And I, they did. And I'm very proud of the songs that I sang in that film. Mm -hmm. uh, Timmy Van Heusen wrote some words to our, my, uh, our love is like a red, red rose. It was a. Uh, a famous poem, and I, I didn't know the writer of that poem, but uh, Jimmy Van Heusen wrote the melody, and I, I, it's as good of singing as I ever did in a film. In fact, uh, Lionel Newman, um, who was the orchestra leader doing the movie music for most of those musical films then, told his musicians, he said, this guy talking about me can sing anything. He's a young Crosby. Well, he couldn't have given me a better, uh, a better co a compliment than that, and that's what I wanted to pursue. But here I was making this science fiction Jules Verne film, but it turned out not only to be a great career move for me, but uh, they tell me later that when 20th Century Fox was about to go bankrupt because of the filming of Cleopatra with uh, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, and they were wasting millions of dollars on their romance and leaving 500 extras waiting in Rome <laughs> to, to try to complete the film. The bankers were getting fed up, and uh, uh, executive told me later that they were going to they were going to shut the uh, bank down as far as 20th Century Fox was concerned because they were wasting too much money. They thought they would never recoup. Never recoup. Journey to the center of the earth came out. And all of a sudden took off and became a box office smash. Mm. And it convinced the bankers to to go along further until they got Cleopatra finished. So it was uh, it was good for everybody. Good for everybody. Film. Absolutely. Also working with the incomparable Barbara Eden, Yellow yep. Canary. And that was in a, a film where I for once went, went against character. I mean, I always wanted to be the nice guy doing things for the right reasons but in uh, yellow canary i played a hypocrite a young singer pop singer who uh, had, was married to barbara eden 
uh, and they just had a child, but I was, I was uh, not a nice guy. And we had various ways of showing me not being a real nice guy off camera or uh, not on stage until our, our, in early in the film, after my, my double image was created, they, um, the film uh, showed that my baby, our baby had been kidnapped and, and, and Jack Klugman was the uh, detective and, uh, and he was, they felt it was an inside job. Somebody in my retinue uh, was, was the mastermind of the, uh, and knew too much about my life and my, my uh, habits and my uh, schedule. And it, and it was an inside job that our son was gone. And that sobered me up, not that I was drinking heavily or anything, but made my best, better instincts come out to the point where, you know, I, I, I had a, a gun standoff with the guy who turned out to be the bad guy who had been my bodyguard, played by Jim Arnett's brother, Steve, let his name slip away. But I'm super sorry about that. <laughs> but but uh, I not had a not McQueen. No, no, yeah. no. Uh, it was, but it was uh, Jim Arness's brother. I, I've just let that name. Yeah. But anyway, it, it was. You can a, text me tonight at two a.m. when you think about it. Okay, when you're twisting and turning. I can. I, I will <laughs> let you know. And then, <laughs> and then, but the, when the movie came out, it was a, it was a Buzz Kulick script. Yeah, it's a, 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 it was a well-written script. It was a, a good film and a small budget, but a good film. And um, when the film came out in, in the London Times, it said the most auspicious acting debut by a singer since Frank Sinatra in From Here to Eternity. So they were impressed with my acting since I was playing against type, for one thing. I wasn't playing the nice young pop singer. I was playing a guy with uh, a, a, a dislikable underside, smoking cigars and, you know, telling everybody what to do and, you know, being Mr. Big Shot. But then when my child is uh, kidnapped and by somebody very close to me, and I know my own life may be threatened, then I, I became, I, I shaped up <laughs> and, <Right. laughs> and changed, you know, changed character to a degree. So that yeah. was, uh, it was a good acting experience. And it's the kind of thing that Elvis had wanted to do in films. Uh, he wanted to do films that demanded things from from us as actors. So right. that we were, in the films that we made, we obviously weren't being, when I, in Journey to the Center of the Earth, I had to learn a Scotch accent. I had to roll the honors and, um, and I got with a guy named Alfred Dixon in New York who taught um, who taught the lady who did <laughs> uh, My Fair Lady, Jill. Uh, we know who that is, that actress who did My Fair Lady. <laughs> you and I can both think about who, who did that. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Julie Andrews. Julie oh, Andrews. She yeah. had a Hockney accent. Yes. And and so I got with the guy that taught her him her that and he gave me the rolling of the order so that when uh, when I was doing my first couple of scenes, Buddy Adler, the head of the studio, uh, playing this young Scottish boy, young man, he said, You know, we like what you're doing, but I gotta ask you to soften that accent. We can't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to soften my Scottish accent. But when my film uh, finally was released in Scotland, and I was there later and, and doing shows and concerts, uh, one of the re re uh, critics said, uh, by the way, what part of Scotland were you supposed to be from? <laughs> because, uh, to him, my Scottish accent was... To nice. hear that accent. But at least... Yeah. So that I, I had... Uh, I had the desire to be the character that I was playing. And when people asked me what you liked about making movies, I, I said, truthfully, I like being somebody else. Yeah. My life as I live it is, I mean, it's miraculous in many ways about what's happened in my life. Yeah, absolutely. But, but uh, most of my adventures are G-rated. 
and uh, and you know I have a I lead personally a, a, an ordinary life, but uh, so it's to be somebody else and take on somebody else's characteristics and and have some of their experiences that I don't want to have in my real life. Tell us that story. That's a great segue to the story that uh, was shared when you were on Johnny Carson on the Tonight Show about your life. Oh, I don't. I don't know if it's, <laughs> uh, if it's uh, heard. Uh, wait a minute. About my life, or was it? Was it? Was it Doc Severinsen? I well, think it was yours, right? <laughs> well, Doc Severinsen. That's when they were doing all these, going back and finding all everything that led up to you exactly what, who you know who you were descended from no maybe it was me oh i think i said when they went back and did all i was was descended from daniel boone the, so you I were said. yeah you were kidded on johnny carson that yeah. you nearly drowned while swimming oh yes and and that my whole <laughs> life flashed before my eyes before while i was in the in, oh oh and i fell asleep <laughs> Reviewing your life. Before my eyes while I was drowning and I fell asleep. <laughs> but then when I said Doc Severson, they checked his family history and it, it came down to a, a ball of lint in Cleopatra's navel. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you, you have, uh, again, crossed paths with some iconic folks over the years. We recently lost the beloved Rosalind Carter. And here's a wonderful photo of the two of you. My gosh. I Tell us that. about this. I know this is special to you as well, Pat. Well, it, it's got two two parts. One is uh, I, I was not in favor of him when he was running for president. Uh, I was a Republican and Gerald Ford, you know, he was running against Gerald Ford. And so I was supporting Gerald Ford. And, uh, and, and I got a uh, card a letter, a little note from him while he was running. He said, I thought you were my Christian brother. I hadn't met him yet. Yeah, Jimmy and, Carter, uh, yeah. But I guess I was wrong because he thought that that I which I should be supporting him as a Christian. And, uh, and so I wrote him a quick letter and said, you know, you're right. I had said a couple of things that just jokingly disparaging of him and um, just making jokes, but uh, the peanut farmer. And... Uh, and I said, you're right. I shouldn't have said anything because you are my, and I want you to forgive me. And I got a note back. No, no apology necessary, Jimmy. And, uh, but I wanted to, because that's a Christian principle. I wanted to know he'd forgiven me. So when we finally met, it was at an airport in Kansas city. I'd just been at a 4-H convention and he was getting off the plane, carrying his own suitcase, of course. And um, we met there on the tarmac. And I said, uh, Mr. President, I and we met very cordial, very nice handshake and so on. I said, I, I ask you to forgive me for saying what I said back then when you were running for president. Oh, forget that. I said, no, but, you know, I really the Bible says that you really should forgive me. I want to know that, that that you do forgive me because I really am sorry that I did it. And he said, well, of course, I forgive you. Of course. And that ended that. But then later, after his. He was no longer president. His 70th birthday came. And to my amazement, he and Rosalind asked me to come and sing happy birthday to him at his 70th birthday in Plains, Georgia. And I did. I've got pictures. I guess you were showing that. No, this was the Hollywood charity dinner. I mean, yeah. Washington charity dinner. That A friend of mine and I, Doug Weed and I, we helped create the Washington charity dinner, which was a big deal there uh, in all society pages, but in other pages as well. Uh, we were honoring people who were in other businesses, but doing things that helped help people and did charitable things. <clears throat> we would have people come into Washington and honor them and, uh, and raise money for charities by just their coming and what we made from the Washington charity dinner. So mm -hmm. several presidents, and I yeah. knew all of them, the only one I didn't meet, oddly enough, was John F. Kennedy. I knew all the other, all the Clinton, others, Andrew Clinton, and all of them. You, uh, you, Mary I think Truman. Truman. One of the, um, I mean, of all the songs you've sung and all of the songs you've written and all, 
you actually, there's one that is very moving, very important. They all are, but one that really um, has this extra quality to it. And I believe it's, is it like the, the Jewish second national anthem? It is, yeah, it is considered. Which is extraordinary. I don't know if everybody knows that, but that is Absolutely. really unbelievable. Yeah, Exodus, this land is mine. God gave this land to me. And it was the melody uh, from the movie uh, that, written by Ernest Gold, the melody composer. Bum 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 thrilling melody and uh Hebraic in its sound and the treatment of it. And when I heard that song and I knew the whole history of the people of Israel because for this is my 46th year, I read through the Bible from start to finish every word, and uh and I keep learning more all the time. But of course I was uh, very much involved in, in the Bible. I had learned to read the New Testament in the Greek in which it was written from Aramaic and uh, Hebrew, uh, you know, in the first century. I, I wanted to be, see I was going to be a teacher preacher, I thought, when when my career took off unexpectedly. But uh, so when when that movie came out, I was so thrilled about uh, the story of of God bringing the people of Israel back and resettling them again in the land he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be theirs forever. And the idea that, you know, they hadn't been there for 2,000 years, and suddenly there was the new Israel. Of course, wars were fought over it. But the, then the, that movie was made by Otto Priminger. So I uh, I wanted to sing the song, and my manager contacted the the publisher, Chapel Music, and they said, well, there won't be any words. Why? Well, we've had composers, and mainly Jewish composers, very talented men trying to submit lyrics for this melody, but three men who have a veto power over whatever the words may turn out to be, one or another have turned down every lyric that has been offered. And uh, so we won't have a, a lyric. We won't have words. It'll just be an instrumental. And um, and I, I thought, well, that uh, oh, Otto Preminger was the director, producer, and Chapel Music themselves, and Ernest Gold. They were the ones, one or the other, had turned down all the, the attempted lyrics that had been submitted. So it was Christmas Eve in 59, and uh, I was listening to the Ferrani Teicher piano duo record over and over, trying to get an idea to submit to a, a Jewish songwriter uh, so I could have words to sing to that melody. And uh, surely my wife was saying, Pat, please quit playing that record. Come help me get the tree, the gifts under the tree so we can go to bed. And I said, okay, just one more time. And I put the needle, boom, 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 boom. And words popped in my head. Uh, this land is mine. And I thought that single singular perspective, and not the trying to trying to convince three thousand years of history of, of all the people of Israel into a short little melody, is futile. But and would be pedantic. But to say this land is mine, one guy saying it, bum 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 bum, God gave this land to me, and I. I said, that's it. That's the way to sing this song. And I want to sing it this way. So I grabbed something and started writing the words in 20 minutes. Just I was like I was taking dictation. I put the needle back on. Dum bum 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 ba dum ba bum 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 ba bum. Da 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 da. And the words were coming. And I wrote it. And 20 minutes later I turned over what I'd been writing the words on, and it was the back of a Christmas card. So now I submit the words. We you know, we typed them out, submitted them to the publisher, Chapel Music, right away. Ernest Gold said, "Yes, these are the words." Otto Bremer said, "Yeah, these are the words." <laughs> He's German. <laughs> and, yeah. and how and it was on the back of a Christmas card too. <laughs> the back of a Christmas card, yes. And about three years ago, uh, I was in Israel for the twentieth time. And after it had already become accepted almost as the second Jewish national anthem, I was there at Yad Vashem in, in Jerusalem, 
And I was not going through again. I was with Mike Huckabee on a tour group. Mm -hmm. And Shirley and I, my wife, we just sat outside and waited because everybody should see God Vashem once. And you'll never want to go through again. But you'll never deny that it happened either. As, as some people have, they don't, they, for reasons I cannot imagine, deny the Holocaust. But you go through there and you'll see the incredible, foul, demonic evils that human beings are capable of toward other human beings. So I didn't want to go through it. I was waiting and this guy came up who was really the executive director at uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. And he had tears in his eyes. He said, you don't know, Mr. Boone. He was calling me and said, please, I'm Pat. He says, uh, what those words you wrote to Exodus mean to us here in Israel, and particularly here at Yad Vashem. And I said, I think I do. His name was Shia Ben Yehuda. I think I do, Shia. I said, I've read the Bible now 20, 30 times, and I know the whole history of the people of Israel. And uh, and so I do know what you were, what the people went through over these centuries, the persecutions, the absolute destructions of Israel when there was no Israel for 2,000 years, and now you're back again. And it's God. It's God working, and I know what it means to you. Uh, and I know the prices Jews have paid throughout time. And um, so he said, well, you must have written those words on something. He said, we're, we're wanting all Jewish kids here in Israel to know those words. They don't have to sing the song. It's, it's wonderful, but it's difficult. Not everybody can sing it, but you sing it. And we'd like those words and for them to know the words. Until I die, this land is mine. Very personal take my hand and walk this land with me. And uh, I said, well, I would I would let you have what I wrote the words on right now, Shia, but I need to let you know I wrote those words on the back of a Christmas card. And he said, so much the better. We know that evangelical Christians are our best supporters in the world. If it weren't for you, we might not exist anymore. And he said, so let us have it. and We'll put it up on the wall of the righteous Gentile. Hmm. along with uh, Corey Ten Boom and uh, Oscar Schindler and others, uh, Christians who were supportive of the Jews during Nazi time and uh, during the Holocaust time. So I, I went back a couple years later, not long ago, and presented the Christmas card, and it is now on display at the Wall of the Righteous Gentile. For me, a, a Nashville kid, Southern boy, Christian, I've been given the privilege writing the words now to be considered the second Jewish national anthem until I die this land is mine and for us to be talking about it right now uh, is very timely because I'm hoping I know it's dangerous for me personally perhaps but I'd like for Israel to utilize that song and my ver my record of it I sing it from uh, in a video from uh, from the place where they made their last stand, Masada, looking out over the Dead Sea, and where the last Jews in the Roman occupation perished, took their own lives rather than submitting to the Roman complete occupation. And they died there on the top of Masada. And they, today, military leaders take their vows up there saying, never again mm -hmm. will Israel be submitted to surrender. And so, I mean, this what we're going through now. It, I, I'd like them to play my record of, of my, my standing up there. It's representing them on the top of Masada, lo out looking over the Dead Sea, where King Herod had his summer home. And it was thought to be unapproachable, but the Romans found a way to build a ramp up there with stones falling on them from everywhere, but shielded. And they built a ramp up there and finally got to the top and found that all the 300 uh, survivors up there had taken their own lives rather than submit to Roman tyranny. So, um, yeah. so that song is timely now. But then, so, yeah. So is the song I wrote um, right now on my Facebook page and on YouTube. I have a tribute to um, uh, Black History, and mm -hmm. the song I wrote of Martin Luther King's words. I had a dream that thrilled my soul. I dreamed that God had made us whole. He loosed the chains that made us 
and set us free and gave us light to let by men see I had a dream. And I wrote that his words set to music the night after his assassination and then did a video. And then on the 40th anniversary of CORE, C-O-R-E CORE, Congress on Racial Equality, uh, the night before uh, Obama was sworn in as the first black president, that night before uh, I was there hosting at the invitation of Roy Ennis, the founder of CORE, to uh, to MC the, the 40th anniversary dinner. And we introduced that video and that song of, that I had written and recorded of uh, Martin Luther King's words that someday we know the time will come a man will be judged, but not by the color of his skin, but the content of his character. And all of that is, is in my song. I mm-hmm. had a dream of his words. Well, I'd like that to be played now during, uh, and we have it on, uh, on Black History Month. Uh, Wonderful and idea. I, and, I, and I've and i got about, I've got 25 songs that are all black oriented. The ones I did with James Brown and, and all the black performers and their R&B hits. And I do my their songs with them, them singing them again with me. But then with uh, the songs I did throughout my career with the best of the black performers singing with them and they with me. And, um, yeah. and then black songs mm-hmm. that, uh, that were known only uh, to mainly the black population. But then I recorded them and they became known as uh, to a larger audience. And so here and Jesse Jackson said he you know, I think I told you that I did more for race relations during the 50s than any other singer. That's so, right. It's noted, uh, yeah. I was doing black songs uh, by black performers, but my way. And I will say this, the scariest night of, of my career was the night the agents booked me into a black nightclub in uh, Akron, Ohio. And they didn't know it was all black. All they knew was they would get they were going to get their commission on what I was going to get paid to come sing in that nightclub. And I was singing all these early rock songs and some others, some ballads as well. And I had my own conductor, pianist, but we were going to use the black musicians, as I'm glad we did, uh, to, to do the music, my songs. And when I got there and realized the whole audience was going to be black and it was a black club, and I'm coming in singing all black songs mainly, and a white guy, and, and I'm doing Tutti Fruity and Long Tall Sally and Rip It Up and and uh, and and expect the black audience to like me doing their, those songs. Although I was doing them full voice and, and you know, uh, giving it everything I had. The musicians, they played the black sounds on their instruments. Mm-hmm. So I had those to song, sing to, which was a big help to me. And then I sang all the songs as black as I could as I sang them. And to, instead of laughing at me, they they were very pleased that a white guy comes into a black club and is singing almost nothing but black songs. And they appreciated it. They, they appreciated they, it, right. They feel really good. I was afraid they might hoot me out of the place. That's it. <laughs> you know, I want to make mention too of all these other wonderful things. You are a prolific, award-winning, best-selling author and this most recent is a piece of art. Oh, Tell us you. about this one. If. I'm sorry. I had, just in case you didn't mention it, I was going to. Oh, see, it. it's <laughs> there. So he has it right there. Yeah, hold it up for us. Yeah, but but because the cover was my design, and and the I felt God uh, compelled me or led me to do this book. The word "if" is is the most important word in the Bible. The way I put it, it starts in Genesis. And every blessing of God comes with an if. He'll, he will bless us in every way that God can bless human beings if we want them, if we choose them, if we're willing to uh, to do anything to uh, not to earn them as much as appreciate them. And so in the in, in the Genesis, you know, Adam and Eve have a perfect setup and they're made in his image and. He gives them everything they could possibly ever want. And this one one command, don't eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you die. They did it. They died. And then 
uh, from that, all human beings, we will all die. And it's because God's, God's blessings don't come with no strings. Not that he needs anything that we, but I realize more and more reading the Bible for now 46 times, all God has ever wanted for us human beings with all of our failings and faults and frailties um, is, is a family. He wants a family of kids who want to be like their daddy and like their big brother, Jesus. And, uh, and we don't seem to get it. We want all the blessings uh, unless we can't find them anywhere else <laughs> without him. But for us just to say thank you and then go ahead, go about living our lives without, you know, like you never wrote, you never call. I mean, like the, like the uh, mama or the, the friend that you never wrote, you never called, never heard from. I thought we were best friends. Mm-hmm. And God thought if he blessed us in all the ways that we, that he could and did, that we would appreciate it by wanting to be like him and wanting to please him and wanting to seek his company. And, um, and it turned out that the, so much of the human race uh, has failed to get that. And so I realized my last effort in books, and I've had best-selling books, uh, big bestsellers, that um, my last thing was to put on the cover, not religious, it's not a religious book, we're selling them in truck stops and airports, and the title, If, If What? The Eternal Choice, we almost made, what choice? Well, let me see, I better f- open this up, and I want the title, If, to uh, convince them to open, at least try to find out, If What? And it's Do you want the very best blessings that God can give anybody for yourself? He wants to give them to you. But he also wants to know that you care enough about him, the giver of every perfect gift, to to want to spend time with him. I like this thing. I just saw Mark Wahlberg and the fellow who plays Jesus now, John, let his name slip at the moment, who plays Jesus in The Chosen, that, Mm. that film series. He's so incredible, and the mm. series is so good that, um, uh, that I, I like the fact that they make Jesus so human yeah. because he did. He became a human being with fleshly appetites. He came uh, you know, seeking fellowship. He wanted company. He loved people. He wanted to be with people always, all the huge crowds that flocked around him. When there were the 5,000 people that had been with him for two or three days, they had nothing to eat. He told his disciples, feed them, feed them. They've got to eat. Right. Well, good. They had five loaves and two fishes, and they fed over 5,000 people miraculously because Jesus was concerned for their, their appetites. And in Revelation 3.20, uh, he has this, uh, he was talking to the church in Laodicea uh, that was already forsaking him in ways. He said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I'll come in and dine and eat with him. And I thought, boy, that's he could have used some other word other than dine. And I said, wait a minute. Don't many of us give thanks for our food before we eat and say grace, as we say, and give thanks? And doesn't that presume that maybe he's around to hear us? And then why not say, instead of making him stand outside the door, I say, hey, come in, come in. He wants to dine with us, to be part of our our meal taking. He could he could vicariously experience it because he uh, in in Luke he's described as a glutton and a wine bibber. That is, he liked his food and even his wine enough that he partook of it uh, vigorously as a human being. Mm. And he knows what it is to be human and to enjoy our food. And and uh, I've done a song called Grits recently. I've got a big hit on country radio right now <laughs> unbelievable here's this picture of me in the truck when i was doing the video of, of grits uh and and they had a grits line dance that's amazing jim you're a, a truly a wonder but uh, and and you're you know truth in advertising you do love your grits i love grits and as fact, we can see here <laughs> I, I do and I had grits and uh, shrimp, shrimp and grits. Where did mm-hmm. we just have it? Just in a restaurant here recently. 
Mm-hmm. There you so, go. South Carolina, South Carolina. South I Carolina. could get anything I wanted on the menu, and I, of course, ordered shrimp and grits. Yeah. But you take them with anything, ham and eggs. I mean, my yeah. housekeeper knows how to make me grits. It's good here stuff. Yeah. And it's but, tied to this, which is something quite amazing. Oh, yeah. yes. The, uh, the, the manufacture and marketing of grits. And I, I think the two different companies, uh, Quaker Oats and another company, General Foods, that 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 produce grits, and um, and I and I'm telling them, telling them because I'm on country radio right now. It's a big hit. Grits is, and it came to me in a dream. People don't know what to make of it. Uh, that that I had that I dreamed this, but I I was chagrined that I wasn't considered as much of a country performer as I want to be. I grew up in Nashville, and I and I have recorded many many country hits. In fact, my my new album is Country Jubilee, twenty five million selling country hits by other artists mainly, and I sing all of them as I've been doing throughout my whole career. And no no other singer has ever done that to record twenty five major country hits, million sellers, in one album by one artist. But that's my latest album. But Grits I've added. And the song grits, grits, bestest food there is, country caviar, Tennessee foie gras, hey grits, grits, bestest food there is, keep your fancy food, give me my grits. And uh, uh, the son of Roger Miller, there were a bunch of country performers that helped me make my record. Um, and and uh, the son of Roger Miller, Dean, paid me the greatest compliment. He said, I, I can hear my dad, Roger Miller, writing that song. Mm. That play on words, grits, grits, bestest food there is. Right. But in the country caviar, Tennessee foie gras, they rhyme, but they, <laughs> but they are good descriptions of grits. So I just, uh, I just feel like I'm getting blessed all along the way. And, and you collaborated with a number, as you say, of legacy artists, the Gatlin brothers, Laurie Morgan, Deborah Allen, and so much more. And it's garnered so far and counting over, what is it, 321,000 streams, 100,000 views on YouTube as well. I mean, and growing and growing and growing. Going, just getting going. Good. I know those are good numbers and I appreciate them, but, um, but, I now have three country records on the charts at one time now. Uh, and then uh, and what then goes I, around comes around. I tell you, it's <laughs> yeah, recorded, recorded yeah. with with Crystal Gale, her big hit. She, look there, <laughs> look, you have this. Gale, we're recording her big. A very hit. intuitive, Pat. <laughs> and with Eddie Rabbit. Uh, her song, Just You and I, Just You and I, we yes. share our love together, we'll be all right. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful love song. And she let me dedicate the song on the video to my wife, Shirley. Mm. And she, I was singing about Shirley, though I was singing with Crystal, and, and we were singing about her and her husband, who was nearby, just out of out, out of frame. <laughs> and, and we each singing about our mates, but there was a bond that, that took place between us when we sang that song. And you can yeah. hear it in the recording. Yeah. And I'm going to be singing at the Coach House, I think, May 11th out here. When I, when I do the show that I'd been billed to do uh, before I broke my hip and I had to cancel it. And I'm now going to do the Coach House May 11th, I think it is. That's fantastic. May, or is it May 13th? It's Mother's the night eat Mother's oh, Day Eve. Mother's Day I'm gonna, Eve. I'm gonna be singing. Crystal Gale won't be there probably, but I will add grits and um, and just you and I to the to my show repertoire, and uh, I'll, I'll sing them both that night when it comes up, and um, and I may have my cane or I may not. I don't I hope yeah. not. I hope I'm functioning yeah. without my cane by then, but I can still sing, and. Uh, and then what else? Oh, and of course, I'll be singing Exodus uh, yes. from, from the movie Exodus. And I'm trying to think what else will I be adding? Oh, the other song that I have out there now on country charts is the latest. And it's because the first two that I've just mentioned, my new song is My Stupid Tattoo. 
And uh, I didn't think, I didn't dream you could have anything about that pictorially. Uh, we, of course. <laughs> We don't have a, a video or anything of that, but it's a song that my conductor, Dave Siebels, and his songwriting buddy wrote um, called My Stupid Tattoo. Well, the, oh, what am I saying? You've got it there. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the Jim Masters show, Pat. <laughs> yeah, and it is, it is in the album as an extra added attraction, My Stupid Tattoo. And it's, it has hit the charts already. In fact, it went to, it was the number six most new, new, most new added uh, in the week that it came out. Yeah. That on the basis of my first country songs in so many years, uh, stupid tattoo about a guy who was stupid enough to have uh, the name Susie tattooed on his neck. And uh, actually when uh, the guy who wrote it submitted the lyric to me, it had, it was on my glute. And that rhymed with something else in the song. And I said, I can't sing that with a tattoo on my glute. And the, <laughs> my, my, my girl, girl has left me. I have a new girl named Holly, and she's not so jolly when she sees the Susie on my neck, not my glute. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I, I cleaned it up just a little as I used to do the uh, rhythm and blues songs that I was right. saying. There were lyrics or, or the metal songs. If there were things in there that I just felt like I couldn't sing, I just. Speaking of the metal songs, yes, right. There was that period. Tell, tell us about that. Well, that was. <laughs> that was, Yes, folks, that is Pat Boone. Yes, it is. Yep, it is. And the biceps and the tattoos. I still have the tattoos, but they're in a box upstairs. Right, exactly. But, I mean, I can put them on any time. But anyway, my musicians, we were traveling in England and doing all my hit songs and the audiences loved them and they said look we we love these songs but can't why don't we go in a studio together and do something else i said well what can i do i haven't done 10 times i've done gospel and pop and um, uh, country and patriotic all these other songs what can i do i haven't done it just be another pat boone album they said oh we never did any heavy metal well we laughed about it for a while and then they started suggesting songs to me that were good songs underneath all the noise and the cacophony that they were meaningful lyrics. And when I heard Ozzy Osbourne's crazy train, I, I realized this was good social commentary about how hard it is for young people today to make heads or tails of society with the, uh, the, the uh, broken promises and the double meanings and the, and the, uh, things that go crazy wrong. And, and so I'm going off the rails on a crazy train. And I realized that's a good, that's a good social commentary song. But then I found that there were uh, good lyric, good meanings like uh, uh, my buddy, Alice Cooper, who right. is the son of a minister. And, uh, and uh, we were friends already. And I knew he was that. And he was also a, a good Christian guy now. And he changes his way he performs. He does a lot of the same songs in his act, and he still paints blue, black tears under his eyes. But uh, but he doesn't do billion dollar babies and baby dolls with ketchup in them, chopped up and thrown out in the audience. He doesn't do anything like that. That was um, crazy, crazy theater that he did. But anyway, I did his song, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And... Um, it talks about going to church on Sunday and Reverend Jones, he punched me in the face. So no more, Mr. <laughs> no more, Mr. Nice guy. And, uh, and I sang that song and, uh, I, I'm, I'm really a nice guy. I help old ladies cross the street. And, uh, and, but if I get, if I won't get treated any better than that, then no more, Mr. Nice guy. And, and so I sang that song and then we went, we together, Dick Clark's idea presented the, uh, Award for Hard Rock Heavy Metal the night before my album of heavy metal classics came out. And I was doing Enter Sandman, Metallica, and, and uh, Stairway to Heaven, and all the and Guns N' Roses, Paradise City, all of these incredible hard rock songs. And, and Dick Clark knew that it was going to make noise, if not become a big hit. So uh, he, the night before it was released, I came out with Alice Cooper to present the award for hard rock heavy metal and his idea, which we both 
Cooper and I both uh, agreed to do, but he backed out of it the last minute without telling Dick Clark. He said, you come out in a V-neck sweater like yours, like I used to always wear and still do, and white buck shoes and carrying a glass of milk and, and your black hair under a golf cap. You come out looking like Pat Boone, and he's going to come out wearing a Bill Baloo designed leather outfit, wearing, ta you know, hopefully tattoos and choker and, and boots and, and he'll be a heavy metal guy and you'll be the Pat Boone and, and uh, you've swapped images to present the award for hard rock, heavy metal. Well, I wore a tux to the red carpet in the beginning and then went downstairs where I would change into this outfit you just showed. And, uh, and he was going to supposed to wear white bucks and he just couldn't do it just, you know, half hour before we went on, he said, I'm not going to do it. I just can't do it because I, I can't uh, take a glass of milk, wear white shoes. And, <laughs> and, and I'm, so I'm just going to go out as I usually do, what he, which we didn't discuss what I was going to do now, but whatever I did, it was not going to make any sense right. unless he was wearing my outfit. Right. And I was wearing theoretically his. So, Dick Clark let me know when I, I went down, got on the tattoos, and I put on the costume. And he let the um, the stage directors know that we had we were he, we picked up a little time. We had some if I wanted to play with it a little how in some way I could. But he didn't say do anything. He just said, if you want to take a little time with it or have fun with it, you can. So when I came out through this heavy fog that he had on the stage, I walk out through darkness onto stage and, and Cooper and not having seen me, his jaw is hanging open and, and he, 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 he's taken back by what I look like because he hadn't seen me. And, and when he introduced me as the future of heavy metal, Pat Boone and I walk out, stomp out in that outfit like a heavy metal guy, the crowd went nuts. It was cacophony of noise and people jabbering. And you, we couldn't talk over it. And he had said, do what you want. So I walked out to the front of the stage <laughs> there, looking at the audience like, like uh, yeah. a, a taxi driver. Hey, you got a problem with me? Yeah. You want a piece of this? Like, like I'm, I'm going to, if you got a problem with me looking yeah. at you? And but I couldn't say it. It was all just. It was all part of. Uh, and I walked back to Cooper, and his mouth is still hanging open. And then he had to say what, what was on the teleprompter. Does this mean I have to sing, "Love Letters in the Sand"? And I prompted, <laughs> prompted the sound man that when he says that, if he does, I'm going to bend into the mic. Give me every effect you can. That would be nice. <laughs> you know, as loud as I can. And. Uh, and again, Cooper backs up, stunned, and the audience was still going crazy. Right. And, and now we go ahead and present the award, and up walks Metallica, and I give them the award for uh, uh, Inter Sandman, and, and 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 they had heard my record the night before. I made sure they heard it, but Cooper, well, Cooper, he hadn't heard that record and didn't know I wasn't. He was, you know, we didn't know we weren't going to swap images. So now Hetfield, the singer for for uh, Metallica, was bowing to me, and and they were saying uh, I was their new lead singer, and which a lot of people, including Christians watching the show, <laughs> took too seriously. They thought that this was factual, and I really was leaving the fold and going to heavy metal, and just giving up my whole, you know, my whole image and career. Yeah, and they and they. Fan, not well, fans, but of Christian TV by the thousands, apparently, they lose the Christian networks. We, Pat Boone, we've lost Pat Boone. He's going, he's off to the dark side. He's going to be a heavy metal singer. So if you play his gospel music show, which was a regular on uh, TBN, Trinity Broadcast, we won't give you another nickel because we've lost him. Well, it took me two months to go on the Christian TV shows with heavy metal bikers that were Christians with, with uh, uh, duck tails and I mean, uh, pigtails and tattoos on their bare arms and all that. But that night, and then to set their record straight that, 
you could be a Christian, still ride a bike and still still like uh, heavy metal music. Uh, and we got it settled and my, my show was reinstituted on uh, on the Christian network. But that night that you showed me backstage, Shania Twain is a small person, beautiful, but small. And I, when I was doing this, standing there at six feet, she was doing chin-ups on my <laughs> pull-ups on my arms. And because the photographers were saying, show us your muscles. Show her. Yeah. Tattoos. And so I went with it. This told me I was enjoying, as I say, as I told you earlier, I like being somebody else. Yeah. So I was portraying somebody that I'm really not, although yeah. I like music and some of the of the biggest of the heavy, hard mark, hard metal, hard rock uh, performers mm -hmm. wanted me to do their songs and the new uh, hard rock album, heavy metal album. Amazing. But ABC didn't want to do it. They thought it was a fluke. It could never be repeated. So there I am, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I sold my Harley eventually and all the proceeds went to charity. And, uh, and I'm back to being Mr. Nice Guy again, which I enjoy. That's it. And he's back to drinking the milk. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. of course, we would be remiss. You know, you have such an extraordinarily loving, close family, your daughters and grandchildren, and great grandchildren and more on the way. Uh, another beloved performer is, of course, your daughter, Debbie. Yeah. And oh, yeah. who does not life. know that song, You Light Up My Life, an iconic song. Uh, there you are together, and here you are as well. Yeah, with the, there's Shirley. We were, yeah. the three of us, this was an appearance that Debbie and I made, and Shirley was there with us, and we got her to come on on, on stage at the uh, at the theater, Andy Williams Theater. Andy and, and had Branson, blown yeah. in Branson. He'd had uh, some something, a blood vessel burst or something. And so here I am with Debbie and we sang together in the, uh, and she sang You Light Up My Life. Did she, I let her, I came in, came out, sang the first song. Boy, you've got the greatest pictures. I don't know how you come up with these things. I tell you. I, I hope you'll let me have a copy of this. I want to show it to my great grandkids. Oh, of course. And great kids. Well, uh, let's see. What's that? Chateau Marmont. What is That's that? That's nice. Oh, I'm, oh, oh my gosh. They've just reminded me that I'm supposed to go pick up my dog, uh, Shadow. He's a Cocker Spaniel. And I didn't oh, realize he walked this long. Cocker and, Spaniel. That's beautiful. He, but he's mm. old now. He's like me. And he has, he, he can't walk with a cane. <laughs> he, he might yeah. have. Let's I uh, have to, Go, Jim. We'll throw this in quick because I know you wanted to mention this country jubilee. Yeah, well, yeah, I love it. I got to be country again the way I grew up. Yeah, and these are. I must say, I don't think any of the original performers would uh, begrudge me having done their songs. Right. And none of them the way I did them. I think I did them proud. All of the songs. And if you ever like country music, you'll love this album because it's twenty-one. No, 26 million selling hits, and I am including Grits in it now, too. You also, you're on the radio, you're doing your own show, and yep. I know you are, you're loving that, aren't you? You're in your element. Let, hang on one second. Can you ask Mike, is he still here? Can you get him on the phone? Ask him to call the place, the Chateau Marmot. I may have it in my phone. The, the number just to tell them because they usually shut the door and, and keep the dogs overnight. And I, I just can't let, uh, no, let you know, you gotta go get, yeah. he, he needs my help. Anyway, what did, what did we leave hanging just then? Sirius XM, your show, oh. you're, you're in your element there. Eight times a week. I had 41 chart records in the fifties. Elvis had 40 and we play not, not just my hits, but all the big hits of the fifties. And I knew all the performers. Yeah. And um, and so I, we tell the backstories and the show is doing so well that yes. just you and me, Jim, don't tell anybody. But yeah, yeah. But I am. Um, nobody's listening. <laughs> you folks don't tell anybody. It's our secret <laughs> that uh, Sirius XM is seriously considering since I have recorded more than any other artist in history. Twenty seven hundred separate songs 
that it might make a great uh, Pat Boone channel on Sirius XM where we can play. I have a show I've created on another network on There it is there, too. There is the SiriusXM.com channels. 50s Gold is the channel. 50s Gold. Look at this shot. I think his uh, picture froze there. Not this picture. As we're getting ready to wrap. Can you hear us, Pat? <laughs> Talk about live, right? Going live. He's in deep thought in that uh, image there while we're getting ready to... His picture, his, probably his Wi-Fi froze up there. But before we get ready to wrap, here's a beautiful shot of Pat and Shirley. You guys have been commenting throughout the entire broadcast. We appreciate you doing that. I know you've been very touched by this conversation. We talked about Elvis and there's Lisa Presley as well, which has been really, really something. That's beautiful. And Tony Bennett, there he is with Tony Bennett as well. And with Dinah Shore. Here's another great one. Look at that shot. Because you know on the left, Barry Manilow. Uh-huh. You know who that is, right? On the left. Type your guesses in the comments, folks. And here's another great shot. Phyllis Diller on the left. Bob Hope. This really has been special. And look at this. Old gang. Really nice. Family. He's a real family man, as we mentioned. Big family and continues to grow as we speak. He's very proud. And he's still recording. He's still doing his thing. I tell you, it's extraordinary. You know, those of you we had mentioned, um, and Margaret as well. And Anne Margaret, if you want to see that episode, she was a recent guest on our show. And uh, she talks about State Fair, which of course she was in with uh, Papoon and a lot of other things. That episode is available on the YouTube channel as well. We're also talking about that's Crystal Gale and the wonderful collaboration and duet that Pat and Crystal had done. And of course, this is very moving. Shirley, his wife, and his daughter, Debbie Boone, another phenomenal singer who's a grandmother now as well, which is so hard to believe, right? Time really does fly. And here's some more. We showed a few of these earlier, but in case you joined us late, here's some early shots of Pat. Television, radio, song, everything. And some more recent photos as well. That's a great headshot. So is that. Another terrific one. And of course, the love of his life. Great love story. He mentioned it in the beginning of the show. If you didn't hear it, I think his uh, signal might have gone out too. Plus he has to go get, he's got to go ahead and get his pooch. Look at this shot. A real icon, a real good hearted guy. Truly a legend on so many different levels. You know, he's, there he is with Shirley. Shirley passed just a few years ago. And it's Valentine's Day when we're doing this episode. So how beautiful 
you know, to have this conversation like this, which went in so many different levels, talking about his career and talking about his family and some humorous moments as well. And of course, his lovely bride. Shirley, there you go. Not beautiful. And there they are when they were on the Chevy show. There are there is Pat Boone and Shirley Boone and the girls. Fabulous story about Elvis and so much more. Wasn't this fantastic, folks? Hey, I want to take a look at a couple of comments here. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thanks for these great comments, everybody. And we, uh, If he is disconnected because of the Wi-Fi or what have you, we just want to thank him for being here because it was really an amazing conversation. And we'll chat with him afterwards. Um, but he is really a true sport and a terrific guy, a real gentleman, right? And uh, let's take a look at some of these comments here. Such a fabulous conversation tonight. Jim, we really did your homework on this one. It was awesome. See all the photos from Pat's incredible career. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much. We've had a lot of comments coming in here. Renee Oscom says, it was a great show. Thanks again, Jim. The pleasure is all mine. Jane watching in Sweden says, thank you, Pat, for being with us. And Jim shared your story. Fantastic, fun, and interesting show. Thanks, Jim. The pleasure is all mine. Yes, that was Roy Rogers that was on the left of that uh, photo. You got it. Maureen said it, and Colin said it as well. Take a look at a couple more comments. You are very, very welcome. Marshall Watson says, great show, Jim. Thank you. Kathleen in New York City, thank you very much for being here, Pat. What an amazing show. Such a treat hearing all your stories. Loved this so much. So did I. Glad you guys enjoyed it. And uh, Renee in Iowa, USA, says, Pat, it was very nice to see you. Thanks for sharing your life story with us. Really, really nice. Lily, thank you for your beautiful comments as well, Lily. It's nice to have you watching and everybody watching, literally, from around the world. I sure wish I had Pat Boone's energy. <laughs> I wouldn't retire till I turned 90. <laughs> well, he's going to be 90 in June, and his family's putting together a wonderful party, you know, for his family, which I think is a beautiful thing. They're all coming together. Hey there, Jim. Great show tonight. Thank you very much. And everybody watching around the world, we've had a bevy of fabulous comments. Now, these are the folks that are watching live. But if you're watching this later in the archives, feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube channel itself. There's a comment section. You can engage with us. And if you enjoyed this episode, like and share. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We would absolutely love that as well. And uh, Merlin, Merlin, watching in Ontario, Canada, says, Pat, it was an eye-opening conversation about your illustrious life. You were one of my idols when I was a teenager. And now, God bless and good night. You met one of your idols on the Jim Master Show. Isn't that incredible? Mm. Thanks to all of these amazing folks who have been commenting throughout. Uh, we love this. Really, really nice. Peter Graves, I think you were saying Peter Graves was one of the names he was looking for earlier uh, in one of the uh, chats. Peter Graves was the person. Yeah. That's the Lovety Squad here coming to uh, the rescue with that name. Thanks, everybody, for all these great. Uh, Christopher Joseph says, great life and career. What an inspiration you truly are. Awesome, Jim. It's so refreshing and beautiful to have someone talk about the living God and Jesus, not to be censored. Last time I checked, it's supposed to be for your country. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to have you here as well. This is so cool. Great story, Renee. Thanks for sharing. And everybody watching. We got some hearts coming in here and lots more. This was wonderful. Just taking, we're scrolling just quickly through. 
Um, you're talking about some of the movies, your favorite songs. This is really nice. Gang, you guys are terrific. And just a lot of comments coming in live. But again, feel free to leave a comment underneath the episode. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much for your support of the Gym Master Show Live. I really appreciate that. And I will send all your love to, to Pat. Um, you know, his Wi-Fi might have gone out on him a little bit there, but he was very much looking forward to being here. And we were so honored and looking forward to having him here as well. And of course, we'll have him back. We'll keep the porch light on for him like we always do. And it was a real honor and pleasure to have him here. Thank you, Kathleen, watching in New York City. Thank you, Renee. I appreciate that as well. Ms. Pat in Texas says, absolutely great show, Jim. I'll be heading to work in a couple of hours with a smile on my face. Pat Boone, truly a wonderful man. God bless. Pleasure is all mine. I do want to remind you folks, if you want to see the episode where Anne Margaret was a guest, that is available. We also have an extraordinary actress, comedian, TV personality, and ventriloquist extraordinaire coming to us from Las Vegas. Look for that episode from Celtic Woman. Celtic Woman is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and I've known them that long, <laughs> having interviewed them on PBS, and several of the ladies from Celtic Woman have been on our series, and... Uh, Guess who we have coming up this week, right on your screen. We also have Carolyn Hennessy, extraordinary actress, you know, from General Hospital, which I believe is celebrating like 60 years. And Anson Williams, you know, who was Potsy on Happy Days. They are going to be together on our show this Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Matter of fact, on tomorrow is April, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Then on Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern, celebrating a special tribute to the 20th anniversary of Celtic Woman, which has a PBS special, new DVD, CD, and they are touring. They're just about to go on tour, so we're getting them just before they hit tour this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. So that's going to be a special episode as we do a special tribute to Celtic Woman. And then Friday night, Carolyn Hennessy, from General Hospital and so much more. And Anson Williams from Happy Days are going to be together because they have a new play that he's directing and she's starring in called Crazy Mama. And we're going to talk about that and we're going to celebrate Happy Days 50th anniversary and General Hospitals, I think it's their 60th, which is unbelievable as well. And of course, we did a wonderful special celebrating Dick Van Dyke for his 90th birthday, 98th birthday, that is, 98th birthday. Uh, if you didn't see that episode, check that out as well. So many wonderful people stopped by the Gym Master Show live series, and that includes all of you. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoyed the show. Again, I will pass along uh, my wonderful greetings that you're saying here to Pat Boone and company. It was really a pleasure to have him here. Uh, here's a couple of things to check out. Of course, his website, patboon.com. You can see all of the th things we've talked about and so much more. This will be archived on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, so you can see it again. Feel free to see it again. It'll be archived there for you. And while you're there, don't forget to uh, like, comment, and subscribe. We appreciate that. And catch Pat on Sirius XM. And, you know, we just... We talked about a lot of different things, and it was so warm and real and flowing. And uh, at the same time, that was just scratching the surface of his epic 70-plus year career. There he is doing his thing on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. And again, if you want to hear his uh, show, there it is. There's the way to get to it. Fantastic show. You're going to love it if you haven't heard it. Great guests. He just had Ann Margaret on recently. Yeah, he's in a sweet spot in his life. And uh, he has he's literally done it all. Again, he's worked very, very hard for all of it, all the successes. You know, you have ups and downs in life, which keep going forward. He's got a strong faith, love of family, 
And all of that pulls together nicely and has is a Columbia University grad, magna cum laude. He even sold Chevy cars. <laughs> he dug ditches. He's done it all. We're talking about music, television, movie legend extraordinaire, Pat Boone. 70 years in the industry. Going to be 90 this June. He's 89 now. God bless him. And uh, wow, what an icon, huh? What a very special episode. All these episodes are special. With all our terrific celebrity guests and friends, all of you watching around the world live and participating or watching these later in the archives. Again, if you're watching this later on in the archives after it was live, we thank you for being with us as well. It means the world to us that you're here. And uh, it meant the world to us that Pat Boone was able to stop by. We thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like. Give this episode a like on your uh, thumbs up there on the YouTube channel and comment and subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. And uh, there it is on the screen. Come see us again with all the great shows. And boy, you can binge watch you know, almost 1,500 shows we've done in just almost four years. We're coming up in just four years' time, which is amazing. You know, it does go by truly in a New York minute. Wow. Mm. Great stuff. And uh, thank you very much. You missed me when I was gone. We were on some television shoots. Uh, in Seattle, Washington, and, and all over the country uh, recently for my professional work. And then we just came back, started kicking off our new season uh, last Saturday with Jonathan Antoine, the wonderful tenor from uh, Great Britain who was on Britain's Got Talent. If you didn't see that episode, it was epic. It was this past Saturday. Hey, uh, it is Valentine's Day at the time of this show. And thank you for those wonderful words. I appreciate them very much, Tommy Reed. Timothy Larson, thank you very much as well. I want to wish everybody a very happy Valentine's Day. Wherever you are watching around the world, it is Valentine's Day. And uh, don't forget to love one another. Take care of one another. Don't forget to love yourself, which is important. And um, enjoy your Valentine's Day. Again, that's the day it is at the time of this show, but you're going to be watching this on 4th of July <laughs> or Easter, whenever, because we're going to archive it for you here on the show. One more time, a very special thank you to the iconic Pat Boone. A real delight to have him on the show. Really, really beautiful. And he's picking up his dog right now <laughs> before the doors are locked. And uh, we appreciate uh, all his time. He's a, he's a class act all the way. So that wraps up this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let us know. Leave a comment again for us on the uh, YouTube channel. We appreciate that. It also helps our series grow when you do that. Uh, you're very, very welcome, everybody. And uh, we will say uh, au revoir for now. We will be back. More great shows coming up right here for you on the Gym Masters Show Live Series. Thanks for being with us, everybody. We love you all. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you to Pat Boone. And thanks to all of you. I'm Jim Masters. Thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, we we'll right here waiting for you in Lovety Hall and on the Gym Masters Show. Be well, take care, and love you all. Cheers. <laughs>